Hey all, Scott here, and this is bad. Real bad. Hey, what's the matter, Do you friend? You're gonna get murdered. Oh no, 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 it's... I can't be here. It's not safe. Things are different now. You see, it's really hard to do a whole living in peace thing these days. That's why I formed a team of ragdag good doers in this world of anarchy. I even came up with the team name, too. We're f***ed. It all started on March 26, 2018, when the Wii Shop channel disabled the addition of Wii Points. The entire shop's about to close down, and recently, the public's went insane because of it. And being one of the few people with a Wii filled to the brim with WiiWare titles, I'm a bit of a hot ticket item these days, AKA, people want me dead. Things weren't like this a year ago. Man, it sure is great buying stuff on the Wii Shop channel. Hopefully the closure of the service doesn't lead to a post-apocalyptic hellscape. Consumerism never sounded this good. The Wii Shop channel was one of the greatest features of the Nintendo Wii in its prime. It was simultaneously behind and ahead of the competition. It didn't have an account system, meaning everything you bought was locked to your console. But the competition simply didn't have the quantity and quality when it came to retro titles. Plus, they didn't have this. No matter how many times I booted up this channel, its music abruptly starting as loud as it does was definitely petrify inducing, but the tune was so slick, it automatically makes anybody want to spend, spend, spend. Speaking of currency, the Wii Shop channel used Wii Points, also known as Virgin Doubloons. 100 Wii Points equaled 1 US dollar. For some reason, game consoles this generation really had a thing for real fake currency. At least Nintendo's conversion rate made sense. The Xbox 360 used to use Microsoft Points, and 800 Points equaled 10 bucks, and let me tell you, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Downloading something was always a hoot. Other systems just gave you a lame progress bar. The Wii says, who likes Mario or Luigi running across the screen? And hey, sometimes you can spit fireballs by pressing A. Such a Nintendo thing to do, to make a download screen fun. Three categories of downloadables here. Virtual console, the shop's pride and joy. One of the best collections of retro games out there. Not only did you get NES, SNES, and N64 games, but Sega Master System and Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, Neo Geo, Commodore 64, arcade games. If you wanted a crash course in gaming history, the Wii Virtual Console wasn't a bad place to start. Most of the games were in their original form, while some featured additions and tweaks. Pokemon Snap allowed you to save pictures to your system, Sonic and Knuckles allowed you to lock onto other Sonic games, and for some reason the Genesis version of Super Street Fighter 2 had online play added. No other version of Street Fighter 2 on the Wii Shop had this, and of all versions to add it to, well, this was a surprise to put it lightly. And doesn't work these days, night's ruined. Wii channels were also offered, being applications ranging from voting channels, Mii contests, Netflix, the works. But we'll be focusing on WiiWare, the term used to describe original downloadable titles made for the Wii. And let me tell you, some of these bad boys are definitely interesting. The beginning of the end of the Wii's online commenced on June 28th, 2013, with the discontinuation of Wii Connect 24, the service enabling you to send messages to friends and whatnot. The Nintendo Wi-Fi connection for the Wii and DS ended on May 20th, 2014, meaning online multiplayer was shut down for games that used the service, but throughout it all, the Wii Shop channel stayed afloat until March 26th, 2018, when you can no longer add Wii points to your account. You can still buy stuff until January 30th, 2019, as long as you still have points, and you can still re-download titles, but after that, the service will be donezo. With that, I think it's a good time to start a journey. I have dozens upon dozens of WiiWare games downloaded, ready to go, so let's take a look at a hodgepodge of WiiWare games, starting with... Dr. Mario Online RX, the long-awaited return of the classic puzzle series. Dr. Mario is pretty simple, line up similarly colored pills with the viruses on the board. Eliminating a virus can make stacked pills fall, and if you eliminate viruses with those pills, you can rack up the points. It's such a simple, fun puzzle game, definitely something to zone out to completely and play for either a few minutes or a few hours. It can get wackily addicting and wackily difficult as well, so this is what hell looks like. That's just the standard Dr. Mario gameplay. We also have another mode titled Virus Buster. 
It's a much, much slower paced version of Dr. Mario where you use your Wii Remote pointer to drag the pills down. It's fine, but not as fun as pure Dr. Mario. The main selling point of this version at the time was the online play, which worked well back in the day. Now we have a few new versions of Dr. Mario, like Dr. Luigi on Wii U and Dr. Mario Miracle Cure on the 3DS. These two are literally the same thing as Online RX and then some, so there's really no reason to go back to this one. Regardless, it's still Dr. Mario and still a solid time. Oh hell yeah! Apparently, we were launched on March 25th, 2008, but that's just a misconception. Really, it launched with the release of Fire Placing. I always felt that the Wii was lacking burning logs, and Fire Placing did wonders to the burning logs market. Well, that's about it for what I have to say, so on to the next son of a bitch, I bought another one. Cozy Fire, the Fire Place genre grows and grows. This one has a dollop of interactivity, like, wow. It's like I'm really regurgitating logs into a fireplace. We even have some extra places to watch a placed fire. This is getting too nuts for me, I better scram. Grill Off with Ultra Hand. It was only a matter of time until a game with this title came out. Grill Off was only available via Club Nintendo, Nintendo's old loyalty rewards program. It was one of the cheapest rewards you could get, so if you never picked it up, congratulations, you don't understand the concept of good deal for a subpar game. It's based around the Ultra Hand, an old toy Nintendo used to make that was basically just a grabber device for kids, invented by the late great Gunpei Yokoi. Grill Off with Ultra Hand is a high score based game where you grill off with Ultra Hand. Pulling the Wii Remote and Nunchuck towards you and back out extends Ultra Hand, you must grab meat when it's cooked to perfection and bring it back to a plate without dropping it or letting it burn. And that's it! It was a cute little reward for Club Nintendo members, but as a game on its own, the controls are kind of awkward and there's really not much there. While we're on the subject of Club Nintendo rewards, Doc Lewis's Punch-Out, definitely one of the coolest exclusive games you could get through the rewards program. Again, there's not much to it, it's beatable in less than 20 minutes, but this was a free reward for Platinum members, those who bought enough Nintendo products in 2009. It's a prequel to Punch-Out on Wii, where Little Mac trains with his coach Doc Lewis. Like I said, there's not a ton here, basically it's just fighting Doc, and it's not even that difficult, Doc tells you exactly what you need to do to beat him. As a game, it's nothing special. As a Punch-Out fan, it's a really awesome little time. I love Doc, so it's great to be able to fight him, and even when you knock him out, you can feel the connection he and Little Mac have. Also, nice. Yes, a WiiWare staple. Sexy Poker is a competent replacement for any form of intercourse. A game for the rest of us. Checking out the gallery, we can see some slick pics of the girls we're about to play poker against. The game also lets out a Hello! If you don't do anything for a certain amount of time, making sure you're not just staring at the screen absolutely dumbfounded that we are potentially going to see a sexy poker. Here we're introduced to Sakura, everybody's favorite nurse. I wonder why. If we impress her, she might give us her special treatment. Thank God, this scoliosis is a bitch. We can see here she's in prime poker playing position. I start pumping Fumbling through a poker game with her and bada bing bada boom, we get the goods. Looks like I have to remove some clothes. Oh. Fuck yeah! If we win the whole game, a jip is triggered. What? What is this? How is this M rated? This is E10 plus at the worst. I'd say this is a great poker game. If you don't like the sexy, thankfully the girls are in the dead center of the screen. Easy blockage can ensue. Five arcade gems, and ah, my two favorite things, arcs and aids. There's only one true thing about that title, and it's five. They called them arcade gems just to get away with the lame length, like there's nothing to these games. They're just high score based mini games. The only game that would even be close to being considered an arcade game would be this shooter, but even then, this one is just boring and lame. We have some grade A voice work employed in these games though. <laughs> My ears have been dying to hear that. Every minigame compilation needs to have a bit of lumberjack in there, and thankfully we have this gnome thing acting like he's talk of the town and telling everybody to throw axes in his direction. Pizza delivery squandered by natives, I've been there. Night shit. This RC car minigame froze after one round, that's all I can say about that one. This is gross, and you'd think it would only be about five bucks, which is still overpriced. No, it was seven. Huh. WarioWare DIY Showcase. I love me some WarioWare, and DIY Showcase, while it's more so a complimentary title, can still be fully enjoyed as a WarioWare game. WarioWare DIY was released for the Nintendo DS, and its main hook was the fact that you can make your own micro games. If you don't know, WarioWare is a series based around five second micro games where you have to figure out how to succeed before the time runs out, and then you move on to the next game. It's fast paced, crazy fun, and I adore it for that. So the idea of making your own micro game was awesome to me back in the day. 
I can't really play it now because honestly it takes a while to relearn the game creation tools. It's nowhere near as simple as Super Mario Maker, but was simple enough for a 12 year old Scott to figure it out. You could also make your own music and comics, but I really only cared about the games. Showcase is a way for Wii owners to play their DIY creations on the big screen. Thankfully I transferred all my games from back in the day and wow, what a resume builder. After connecting online you can play micro games from people all over the land, but Nintendo Wi-Fi connection is dead. Yikes. Nintendo included some of their own micro game creations here, so you can still play this as a standard WarioWare game. These micro games are much simpler than other titles in the series, and rightfully so, since they were all made with DIY's game creator. They were also made to be played with the DS touchscreen, so the only thing you're going to be doing here is pointing at the screen and clicking A. It's an incredibly simple, yet fun time, but it was much cooler back when it was relevant and when the Wi-Fi connection was alive and well. My Aquarium 2, a virtual aquarium in a single Nintendo Wii. 2010 was crazy. In terms of my own aquarium, I'm a single rock kind of guy personally. I do have to say, the default carnival music that plays here really makes me feel like I'm actually staring at a real life fish, it's insane. Shaking the Wii remote simulates tapping the glass, and rather than discouraging the player from doing that, the fish give a solid shake back. Thankfully, all is saved as we can share our aquarium to friends. Damn it! Excitebike World Rally, a triumphant revival of the Excitebike series, developed by Monster Games, who made Excite Truck and Excite Bots. This is the first entry in the Excite series they developed that went back to the roots of the franchise and proves that Excite Bike can work really well in the modern era. If you played Excite Bike on the NES, World Rally is basically the same, but obviously with an upgrade to the graphics and sound department, more to do, and online play originally. You have to perform jumps, avoid other riders, make sure you don't overheat, and make it to the finish line all while making great time. It's a fun game, and while the production values on the game are far from high, it's passable, this is Excite Bike, and it's a WiiWare game. You can edit tracks just like the first game, and holy cannoli, you can actually save them! I quite enjoy World Rally, and wouldn't mind seeing another Excite Bike game like this. The moment everybody's been waiting for, my coverage of Let's Create Pottery, the only pottery-based game with an email inbox and an auction mechanic and a heartfelt message from the developers. For what it is, a pottery creation simulator, it does the job. You have loads of options to unlock, and you can make a wide array of pottery. Here I made an ashtray, and here I made a Chinese finger trap. Enjoy your massage. Yep, you read that right. It's not a title, it's a command. As we can see here, I'm the protagonist, Nipple. And this game has already given me the heebie-jeebies. The selections won't stop growing, and Christ Jesus, the people won't stop growing either. As you could have easily predicted, Enjoy Your Massage is a hybrid between Simon and Tic-Tac-Toe. Repeat the beat on these markings, just begging for a WebMD search. Repeat it successfully enough times, and bam, the client happily goes about their day via a static image that makes you triumphantly think, yup. I did that. Man, these clients. Nice back usage, guys. We have such a very list of clients. For example, Inus has a backache and Alice's back hurts. After defeating any and all clients, you're tasked with the final boss, your boss, Gazelle. Your reward? You take over the business after only 45 minutes of playing. Well, that was a nice mishmash of Wii Word titles, but don't worry, we have loads more to cover soon. And doing so will allow the Wii Shop channel to end gracefully, everybody will cherish their memories, and people will move on. Man, what I would give to be March 2018, Scott, again. But hey, who knows, maybe things have cleared up in the past 12 minutes. Christ, I'm mental. Hey y'all, Scott here, and yes, it's been about a full day since I last reminisced about the Wii Shop channel being open for business, back when WiiWare was WiiWare. But I can't think about that without remembering what it was like when they first disabled the addition of Wii Points. Man, I haven't checked the Wii Shop channel since I last went on a WiiWare binge. Apparently you can't add Wii Points anymore. <laughs> I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> Well, that hurt a lot more than I expected it to. One sec. Yep, expected to hear that. Anyways, let's take a look at some more WiiWare games in remembrance of what once was.
Fluidity was a really unique title published by Nintendo. You control water and tilt the Wii Remote to move around. You have to keep enough water together to traverse the environment and solve puzzles. Ladies and gentlemen, meet your next Smash Brothers character, but honestly, it's a really unique game that deserves more attention. It's pretty relaxing just controlling and listening to the flow of water. And to see your water make it to the end of a level to flood buffalo, there's really no other feeling like it. I also hate to see any water get left behind. You really want to make sure any and all make it with you to the very end. I really hope this game makes a comeback in some form. There was a sequel in the 3DS eShop, so who knows? Muscle March. Oh man, why wasn't this cursor in Mario Galaxy? It was originally an arcade game that never released, apparently, so Namco decided to barf it onto WiiWare. We get to pick our character, and this is just physically improbable. Talk about unrealistic expectations. I'm part of a band of greased up muscle freaks trying to regain their protein powder, and that's only the third time I've said that today. You have to pose with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck to make your way through obstacles. If the person you're chasing puts both their hands up and goes through a wall, well, you better put your hands up to ensure you will fit through that wall. And surprisingly, the controls work alright. But after a solid 10 minutes of playing this, I think I've gotten my muscle march fill. After loads of peer pressure, I finally played it, and I'm content leaving it at that. Pong Toss, the only game to feature the copyright year as an integral part of the logo. It's a frat party game and has two modes to play in sh they got Vince Valenti to program this? It's a Wii version of Beer Pong now. I'm definitely gonna be critiquing this one hard. It better live up to Beer Pong's legacy. I know everything about the sport. Blue 42, hike, hike. You just throw balls in the cups, but God, I am no good at this version, and I'll just blame it on the controls. I mean, it's Pong Toss on WiiWare. I don't think the Pong Toss community is gonna crucify me. Hopefully. I either overshoot it or don't shoot enough. I'm not a fan of the controls here. I can't get a good grip on how hard to throw. We also have Speed Pong, which is beer pong with Mario Kart items. Woo. Retro reboots became a thing back in the WiiWare era, bringing back an old school franchise while purposely retaining old school elements. Headlining this trend was Mega Man 9. The Mega Man series was in a weird space. The classic series, as it's referred to now, was a bit dormant. The last release was Mega Man and Base on the Game Boy Advance, which was a port of a Japan-only Super Famicom game from 1998. Mega Man was far from dead. The series was staying alive with subseries like Mega Man X, Battle Network, Zero, all that jazz, but regular vanilla everyday Mega Man games weren't too awful frequent. To see Capcom not only revive the main series with 9, but also use 8-bit graphics akin to Mega Man 1 through 6 was pretty crazy. It made sense though, I mean, that's how most people remember Mega Man. But they didn't just go retro with simply the presentation. Mega Man 9 is basically Mega Man 2, 2. Games after 2 started introducing things like Rush, the Slide, the Charge Shot, all that. 9 throws all these out the window and stays true to Mega Man 2. Even the menu themes are ripped right from the game over screen from that game. All you can do is hop and shoot in terms of your bare moveset, which some people really didn't like about 9. It felt like a regression rather than moving the series forward. But to that I say, oh me oh my, this game is great. If you can look past the simple moveset, Mega Man 9 has absolutely superb level design and music. Eight new robot masters to take on and powers to cop, with one being the first female robot master in the series. Ooh, la, la. It was primarily developed by Inti Crates, and these guys know how to make retro style games. Like, look at this, this looks like it came straight out of an NES. They even included an option for sprite flickering, purposely throwing in imperfections into the game to keep it feeling old school. I don't know why, but I love that. There's tiny little things they did here and there that couldn't have been done back on 8-bit hardware but it doesn't feel out of place at all in the game. Capcom released a sequel, Mega Man 10, which is again another retro style Mega Man game. It was a really nice little throwback, but I'm happy to see Capcom pushing the series forward with a new direction and style in Mega Man 11. My Little Baby, finally, a game with a fetus opener. The game shows off the stunning timeline, a fetus to game in a matter of four photos. We get to pick everything about the dad and the mom with this baby. We're keeping things strictly European. Our nanny pummels in here to tell us to do things. Seriously, we hire the nanny, she's telling us how to take care of our baby. What a jip. In terms of the name, I decided to go with Vinegar. And here we are. Was that pregnancy really worth it? I mean, sure, I think we had a Vegas-style birth. This thing took the length of two pictures to bake, but still. We can take pictures of Vinegar. I'm labeling this one Summer Fun. 
Now we have to clean up the room our baby's in, and this baby is an absolute animal. I clean up his mess of dirt and grime, leave the room, come back, dirt and grime make a huge comeback. I decided it's time for everybody's favorite baby to take a nap, but no matter how fast I rock the cradle, he won't go to sleep, so we're gonna feed him instead. It's a good thing they included this feature, without it I would hate to see the review scores. After a solid feed sesh, it's time to change the baby's diaper, and don't you just love it when your sh** can double as a sensor bar? I ran to the store to buy things for Vine, and I gotta dock points for the lack of realism, you can only buy 5 bibs of each color. And that's my little baby, just a relaxing game, this surely is the life. Ah, my baby's dirty. Next game. Star Soldier R, a triumphant return of the Star Soldier series. What? Yeah, I've never played a Star Soldier game before, and to be honest, I didn't even know this was a series. I thought this was just a retro-style WiiWare shooter. They were primarily on the TurboGrafx-16, so... Can you really blame me? Star Soldier R is an arcade shoot-em-up with three modes to dig right into. Two minute, five minute, and quick shot. Each is all about just getting the highest possible score that you can, and each go through the exact same song and dance. Obviously, if you want to see everything the game has to offer, 5 minute is your go-to mode here. If you want to just jump in and blast through the main game to try and have a high score, 2 minute mode is for you. And if you only have 10 seconds to spare and have an attention span that stopped paying attention when I started talking about fluidity, then quick shot. You can hold down the button to shoot repeatedly, or you can turn on the manual option, or as I like to call it, welcome to the hernia zone. I thought Star Soldier R was fun, but I'm basically done with it forever. I just don't really have a reason to go back to it, sadly. It just doesn't have enough meat on its bones. There's only so many times I can play through, say, 5 minute mode over and over again. Still a decent game, I'd like to see this one come back on modern platforms one day. I couldn't afford Grand Theft Auto V, so I bought Copter Crisis on WiiWare instead. I mean, you can pilot a helicopter in both. It's like substituting Coke and Mentos with Fago and Altoids. You hold the Wii Remote like a flight stick to pilot the helicopter, and the controls work pretty well, to be honest. The problem is, the rest of the game is just hard. It's just boring. You have to pick up or drop off things, that's it. It's the same environment over and over again. Where even am I? The game had some potential to be fun if the environment you were flying around in was interesting, but we're just flying in Rocktown. At the end of the mission, I always go straight for the wall, but it never lets me crash, lame. Aha! I got it! A game called Aha! I got it! The perfect name for a game. Your dad starts chatting up a storm with you and says you're growing up. I'm so proud. Proud of what? Mortality coming sooner? For your birthday, your dad locks you in a room and you have to find your way out, aka your dad is shit. Wait, why is the kid wishing himself good luck? It's a point and click game, find clues to help you escape. That's literally it, but at least they made it interesting by focusing on child abuse. Max and the Magic Marker. Now, this is the free demo version, as it was the only way I played this game back in the day. I played this demo quite a few times, but never bought the full game, unfortunately. The game focuses on Max, who draws this eggplant monster, and you have to try and stop it. It's a pretty basic platformer where you can draw things to interact with the environment, whether that be creating platforms, steps, shields, weights, the works. If it weren't for the Magic Marker, this game wouldn't be anything to shake a stick at, but because of it, I've always had a soft spot for this game. The demo, that is. Like I've said, I never fully bought it. The main problem I do have with it though is that drawing with the Wii pointer has always been really awkward for me. Thankfully the game is available on PC and DS which makes the drawing mechanic much more natural. The game received a sequel recently, Max and the Curse of the Brotherhood, Jesus, this is the same series? Holy sh**, we're in for something alright, Hockey All-Star Shootout. And this, my friends, is what we call intuitive controls. Move the cursor with the stick, shoot with the Wii remote, seems easy enough, damn it. This is the game, just trying to shoot the hockey puck into the goal. Yeah, I've already noticed quite a trend with WiiWare games being cheap cash grabs with little to no substance. Many of these things are literally just high score games, and there's nothing wrong with high score based games, but you gotta have substance. There's a secondary mode where we have to knock over this ice and few things look more depressing than this. I mean, were you really expecting a downloadable Wii game service without Tetris? Tetris Party is a really decent version of the classic game. You have standard Tetris, kinda hard to mess that up, but we have this added benefit of our me cheering us on. Here I just have a default one in the background, but man, look at him go. 
We also have a ton of really cool modes which offer unique takes on the Tetris formula. Shadow has us filling in pictures with Tetris pieces, Field Climber has us building steps for a little guy to climb up to the very top, Stage Racer challenges you to fit your Tetris piece through a maze in the quickest amount of time possible, and the Wii Balance Board mode challenges us to maintain sanity. Overall, Tetris Party is a great version of the classic puzzle game. Sure, the presentation is a bit bland, but it's still quite a lot of fun. There was an expanded retail version released as well, entitled Tetris Party Deluxe. Back when you had the choice between the two versions, Deluxe was two times the price at 30 bucks. The standard Tetris Party offered more than enough to satiate that Tetris craving we all have from time to time. It was definitely a must-have on WiiWare. Fast Draw Showdown, somebody in the world's childhood is right in front of us ladies and gentlemen. I didn't know this before downloading, but this was an old arcade game in the same vein as Mad Dog McCree. Live action footage that you shoot total guns at, the future is here and it is incredibly underwhelming. The game's displayed in iPhone portrait mode and we're greeted to Wes Flowers. My name's Wes Flowers, I'm one of the world's fastest quick draw. Damn! Since we're dealing with flicking the Wii Remote up quickly to shoot, better put on the protective jacket. Yeah, I'm a bitch. We meet a lot of colorful characters we have to slaughter, like Crazy Curly. Put it back in the holster. God, who knew West Flowers was such a square? <laughs> Alright, and we've seen the entirety of the game. It's just Quick Draw with West Flowers. It sells itself. Alright, and that should hold me over for a while, but we still have loads more WiiWare games to look at. Definitely a solid way to pass the time before the shop channel gracefully and peacefully comes to an end. Was I f***ing mad? Well, at least we're in the post-apocalypse now, and it can't get any worse than post-apocalyptic. Hey y'all, Scott here, and I'd love to putz around and talk some Yoshi touch and go, but I have places to do and things to be and I have to loaf around in the cellar for a while. You see, I thought we were in the post-apocalyptic phase of the Wii Shop Channel closure, but NOPE! It turns out we were only in the pre-apocalyptic phase. We're currently in the apocalypse phase since people can't basically buy WiiWare games anymore. And since I'm one of the few people with a Wii system filled to the brim with WiiWare games, I'm a wanted man. Just look at this. That's me! I don't know who else it could be! If only past me would have done something about the Wii Shop Channel closure and not just exploit and show off old WiiWare games. Let's take a look at some more WiiWare games. Castlevania The Adventure. <laughs> yeah, it reeks. So why not play the vastly superior recreation, The Adventure Rebirth? This was in the lineup of Rebirth games Konami put out on WiiWare, the others being Contra Rebirth and Gradius Rebirth. These three games were treated as throwbacks to yesteryear, hearkening back to the earlier titles in the franchises. Adventure Rebirth was the only one of the three that was fully based off of a past game and improved on everything from the original. It controls better, sounds better, looks better, it's just an overall better experience. It really makes me go, oh, why are more bad games remade like this? It replaces a bad game with a better one. And then I realized, Oh, well, nobody likes bad games, so it's safer to remake a game people actually like to begin with to ensure the most sales. Oh, well, Adventure Rebirth was also noteworthy for being one of the first Castlevania titles in forever that followed the pre-Symphony of the Night gameplay formula for the series. It's just pure simple Castlevania, and while it's not mind-blowing or anything, it's definitely a highlight on the WiiWare service. So this is why Konami stopped making games. Ant Nation is for the ant lover in all of us. The title is jam-packed with 100 ant-filled missions to complete, ranging from touching your ant to using a magnifying glass. I love ants, so this game just speaks to me. Whenever anybody asks, hey, what do you use your Wii for these days, I always tell them Netflix and ants. Well, that's Ant Nation for you. it's an ant simulator. I got as much out of it as I could, and unfortunately stopped playing before we got to the amp reading portion of the gameplay loop. However, there is this bonus game we still have to check out. And this was the moment I discovered some guy Konami really f***ing hates ants. JESUS! This entire mode is dedicated to torturing and killing ants with an assortment of tools ranging from rockets, fire, a foot. I'm not gonna lie and say I didn't enjoy this compared to the main game, but holy sh**, guys. I guess Konami didn't want to corner themselves in the ant lovers only market and truly made this game for everybody. TV show king. I actually played this back in the day. It was published by Discount Ubisoft. Game Loft. 
They've made some of the highest quality shovelware out there. Nothing that's utter trash, but nothing too awful great either. With a name like TV Show King, I assume this was gonna be a trivia game about TV shows. Well, I'm not a fucking genius, it's just a trivia game show, but I am a fucking genius, so we're gonna be limping along on genius difficulty. We're greeted to our host, Jerry. They really pulled out all the stops on this one. Think of TV Show King as Wheel of Fortune meets Who Wants to Be a Millionaire meets a 65 on Metacritic. Also, this game really has a thing against commas. What's a two-handed hand plan in snowboarding? Well, I already answer handy to most questions, so why not? As the rounds progress, TV Show King likes to make sure you're still paying attention by upping the ante, like making you remove the crust on the choices before selecting and illuminating them with your remote. I lost. Flight Control was a mobile game from four score and seven years ago. Like, this sat there alongside the titans of the industry. Cut the Rope, Angry Birds, Coin Flip. This was a game that was consistently at the top of the App Store charts. You just had to guide airplanes and helicopters to safely land without crashing into one another. And if you said, man, but I wanna play this with that Ant Nation controller, you're in luck because they released a WiiWare version. It's basically the same game, but you play with the Wii Remote Pointer. It works well enough and is pretty decent by early iPhone game standards, but a Wii game though? I don't know, it's just not the most well-suited title for home consoles. Like, you're only gonna play for five minutes at the most. A decent mobile game that works well on the Wii, but doesn't feel quite at home. Space Invit, damn it. WiiWare was truly the second coming of arcade titles. So many made a return on the service, so it was inevitable a reboot of Space Invaders would appear at some point. They're trying to add some plot to this, that's adorable. All right, let's get this over with. This is nothing like what I was expecting. I just assumed this was gonna be an upgraded version of Space Invaders, but on WiiWare, but the title doesn't lie. This is what happens when Space Invaders get even. You control the invaders and destroy a city. The concept is interesting, I'll give them that. It's kind of like Pac-Man Versus, where that was an old school arcade game letting you experience it from the enemy's perspective. But this is where my interest starts to wane. It's mildly entertaining for a bit, but it's pathetic in terms of content. You only get three levels for 500 Wii points and have to buy the rest of the game through more content packs. The overall price ends up being around 20 bones, and I'll definitely say I got my fill with just playing the first stage. I think it would have been best for this game to come with all the content for 10 bucks total, no extra level packs or nothing. Because as it stands, for five bucks, I feel like I wasted my money, and the idea of spending $15 more on this game made it difficult for me to fall asleep the past few nights. Bit Trip was a series of rhythm games released via WiiWare, all using Atari-style graphics with some modern-looking effects. I gotta say, with video games, especially indie ones, being obsessed with 8-bit graphics, seeing this style with such pizzazz is really something. I wish a few more games looked like this. There were tons of Bit Trip games released on WiiWare, the most popular of which being Runner. You have to avoid obstacles and nap collectibles to the beat while running automatically. This is only the demo version, though. I never played the Bit Trip games when they initially came out, but this is a pretty fun time. Thankfully, there exist multiple ways to play the Bit Trip series outside of WiiWare, including various physical releases, so definitely try this out if you get the chance. Runner also received some sequels, Runner 2 and Runner 3, and again, I haven't played these games, man, the original Runner just looks so much better visually in my opinion, it just feels so much more unique. Soccer Up. The title alone got me excited. It's a soccer game based on my favorite direction. How could this go wrong? You have to pick a team. Well, North Korea sounds fun. And we're off, and Soccer Up is much more generic soccer game than I initially thought it would be. Remember Hockey All-Star Shootout from last time? I was expecting Soccer Up to be a garbage game like that, a mini game where you're shooting soccer balls into a goal or something. Nope, it's a completely different garbage game. It's just generic soccer. And pardon me, I don't play a lot of soccer games. No. But I can easily say that it is crazy difficult to keep track of who's on my team and who's not. Sure, the different teams have different colored jerseys, but the fact that all the models are the same with either dark or blonde hair makes it confusing. Other than that, this is basically like NES soccer, but with 3D graphics. Like everybody else with an opinion, I'm not a fan of NES soccer, but it was fine for the time. Soccer Up really has no excuse. Mr. Driller! Mr. Driller W, out of 26 letters, they chose that one. The series is a spin-off slash spiritual successor to Dig Dug and is more so puzzle-oriented. You have to drill through all these blocks while avoiding getting squished or running out of air. It's a fun time and can get wildly difficult. You have all these different characters to choose from, all with unique attributes, including the original star of Dig Dug himself. While it's a good version of the game, Mr. Driller W has very little differentiating itself from the various other titles in the series. That was a problem with a lot of WiiWare titles at the time. Many of them are simple high-score-based games with better versions available elsewhere. 
Speaking of which, Frogger is an absolute classic. Its gameplay still holds up to this very day. Konami really tried to make Frogger a bigger name in gaming as the years went on, but he's more or less faded into obscurity. But this is what happens when Frogger returns. Oh god, it's like he never left. Frogger Returns makes me wheeze. This is just Frogger again, but it looks like trash, the music is disgusting, and the camera angle makes it difficult to judge where you are in comparison to other things in the world. Look at these dogs. Stop. Rabbit's Lab is why many people don't like the rabbits. It's a simple idea. A rabbit is inside your Wii remote. You can hit buttons and shake the thing to cause mayhem. You can then paint, customize, and perform a hate crime on them. That'll be 500 Wii points, please. This should just be a mode in a game. In fact, from what I've read, it is a mode in Rabbids Go Home. I've actually heard this is a pretty good game. I personally haven't played it, but I personally have played Rabbids Lab. This is somewhat amusing for two minutes, but within that time, you've seen everything the game has to offer. Next. Happy Holidays Halloween. Before you say thank you, let me talk about this game. This is a Halloween e-card creator on your Wii. You can pop a very select amount of art on a card. Maybe some text, a sound or two, blam. Send it to your Wii friends. Hallmark must have pissed themselves when this thing was announced. Through Space is a Nintendo published game all about cramming Tetris wannabes into holes in the wall. How I know what everybody is probably thinking. This is just a ripoff of Muscle March. Well, Through Space is really its own thing. It doesn't have whatever the hell this is, but it makes up for it by just being a simple addictive puzzle game. Personality wise, it's got nothing, but it's fun enough, I guess. Now, of course, it had that classic Nintendo tax and cost $8. I don't know if it's worth that, just for comparison, that's how much most Super Nintendo and Genesis games cost on the Wii Shop. It's a solid little puzzle game, but nothing more than that, really. Every downloadable game service needs a game based on Robin Hood, so it was a shame that WiiWare got stuck with this thing. I'd call it an on rail shooter, but it's literally just a static image where you shoot people running around. Apparently Robin Hood is all about killing the rich and helping the poor, so it makes sense that your points get docked if you shoot an innocent person, but why do you get crazy high points for killing a bird? The game is just monotonous. Reloading your arrows takes no time at all, so there's really no challenge here. It's almost impossible to die. It's just a game of endurance. We also have this guy making an appearance every now and then. That's all I have to say on the top of him. This is the story of a lonely boy who was given a dolphin by King Triton and then vowed to give all the sad children in the world Wii remotes and dolphins. This is the worst Christmas ever. And that's the story of My Dolphin, a game about petting your dolphin and having to do tricks for an audience. I guess you have to buy the extra dolphins in the game to find out whatever the hell happened to King Triton. I named him Puddles and he can do this. I think I finally found my dolphin game, everybody. We've really looked at a lot of WiiWare games, but the only thing that matters is that we finally looked at one that allowed us to make a card. <laughs> I'm gonna send this to future Scott, maybe around January of 2019 or so. He'll really get a kick out of this. This does nothing for me. Well, with the Wii Shop channel closing on January 30th, I should really take time to appreciate what I have. Uh, a Wii filled with WiiWare games and an open cellar door. Huh. Really makes it easy for anybody to come in and steal the- My net worth! Hey all, Scott here. I originally abandoned this place back when the whole Wii Shop channel closure pre-apocalypse thing started because I had a Wii full of WiiWare games and everybody wanted to kill me. But now since my Wii has gone missing, I can finally relax again considering the fact that I was taken off of the FBI's most wanted and I'm now on the FBI's least wanted. That makes me feel like a fucking loser. I mean, it's whatever. I have nothing to worry about now. Plus, I still have the memories of playing all those WiiWare games. Uh, like that one time I played a bunch of them, like a month before this whole thing happened. Oh god, that was when I played Family Go-Kart Racing. Oh, well this looks playable! No? Family Go-Kart Racing is the family-friendly alternative to Mario Kart. You ever play Mario Kart Wii and say, man, these characters are cool and all, but... Where's Dad? <laughs> yep, the whole family's here and they're ready to star in f Family Go-Kart Racing is garbage. Yeah, I said it. Steering in this game is a nightmare. The motion controls don't work. Either you don't turn hard enough, or you turn harder than hard, and no matter what, you end up mourning the loss of a family member. Technically, there's 12 tracks in the game, but really, there's four track themes with three variants separated by difficulty. Doesn't matter in the end, because each track is damn impossible. Jesus! If only this game was good and sold more, maybe then my dad would make it into Smash Brothers. Outside of Pokemon Fruit Snacks, I haven't really delved into the Pokemon franchise all too much, so why not make my second experience in the series be Pokemon Rumble? The demo version, that is. 
This, alongside My Pokemon Ranch, were the only two Pokemon titles released on WiiWare. My Pokemon Ranch was the leading cause of disgusting logo syndrome, and one of those simulation titles that WiiWare was flooded with. You know, you sit there, can slightly interact with the animals, maybe move around, that's about it. Pokemon Rumble is a different story though, it's all about mashing that 2 button and not much else. You control toy versions of Pokemon, which really means here's a canonical reason as to why these models look so bad. You just keep moving forward, pummel other Pokemon, face a boss, pummel them, move on to the next area, and then duke it out in the Battle Royale. I mean, this is just a demo, but from what I've played, Pokemon Rumble is just too simplistic and repetitive for my liking. They made four of them. I never downloaded this initially, mainly because do I look like a Pokemon Rumble downloader to you? I also never downloaded my Pokemon Ranch. I mean, I already had enough WiiWare simulation games. Speaking of which... <laughs> yeah, I'm a zoo guy now. My zoo is all about complete freedom. It's your zoo, do whatever you want, including having only three exhibits with three of one animal type in each. We have it all. We're really hitting it out of the park with all the bear fans out there. We got this elven frying in the kids' room, and of course, you can't forget the zebras. You can name your animals. That's my zoo for you. A big part of the game is breeding your animals, but all that gets you is another animal. I can add three bears to the bear exhibit right off the bat. Why would I want to worry about child bears? My zoo is a little too just watching 3D models of animals walk around y for me to really get into it. But hey, if you want to name a zebra Fallout 76, my zoo fully supports that feature. Bubble Bobble is an undisputed classic from the arcades, NES, Game Boy, Master System, Commodore 64. Shove your hand between the couch cushions, you'll find a different version of Bubble Bobble. Why not add to the list with a remake of the original on WiiWare, Bubble Bobble Plus. Now with brand new visuals, oh god. Bubble Bobble Plus is an enhanced remake in the sense that it's fundamentally Bubble Bobble Plus. It has everything the original had, plus more content. Four player, multiplayer, even two level packs you could buy. Sure, the graphics are kinda and disgusting. It just looks so cheap. I'd really prefer if they just went with sprite art or a 2D hand-drawn look. Disregarding that, this is just straight up Bubble Bobble. The NES version was on the Wii Shop channel for 500 Wii points, with Plus going for only 600. That's only a dollar extra for quite a bit more content added. It's nothing groundbreaking, but Bubble Bobble Plus is just more Bubble Bobble, and that's alright in my book. Xmas Puzzle shows me what Christmas is really all about. Oh yeah, that happened. I find it cheap how they show you a blurry version of the full image behind everything, that just makes things too easy. In the end though, Xmas Puzzle delivers the religion puzzle based goods and then some. Not only do you get Xmas Puzzle, but more Xmas Puzzle. Somebody grab a plural form. And Yet It Moves was one of the most unique releases on WiiWare. It started life out on PC and eventually made its way onto the platform and oh, oh it's so good. A simple platformer where you have to rotate the world around you to progress, and it really makes you rethink everything about the world you're in. What can be a viable platform to use, how to use the train to your advantage, everything. You gotta be careful though, because you do die if you fall from a great enough height. Now this is just the demo, I missed out on the game initially, but I always heard great things about it. The thing that mega blows though is that the WiiWare version was the only console port of the game ever released. It's only available on computers, and it made its way to iOS under the name Yet It Moves, but I believe it's no longer available. Come on guys, get this baby on modern platforms. Snowpack Park, made by the fine people at Skip, who made this, which led to this. This is a- oh Jesus, again? This is another simulation game for WiiWare, just like my Pokemon Ranch, and my zoo, and my aquarium, and my little baby, and Ant Nation, and my dolphin. Only now I truly realized how many of these games flooded WiiWare, and they all share a common problem. There's nothing to them. Most of these games are basically just watching an animal do something and you can interact with it in like two ways that don't matter at all. Like, oh, you can pet the animal and you can clean up after them and that's it. Now to be fair here, Snowpack Park is much more gamey than a lot of the other simulation games, but it isn't all too remarkable. You raise penguins, you fish for food, you find more penguins, you raise penguins, you fish for food. Now the bulk of the entertainment value you can derive from these games really depends on how much you're willing to let your imagination go wild with these things and make up a lot of the fun yourself. It should also be noted that I can tell these games are supposed to be bite-sized experiences, played for like 5 minutes a day. You download them so they're always on your system, so after you're finished playing another game, hey, why not check in on the penguins? The problem to me is that all these sim games I've looked at just don't have enough to them. They give you like two things to truly mess around with, and that's it. I need more customization, I need more things to do to get me involved, and these games just don't do that. There you go, let that be a lesson to all you WiiWare developers out there. Paint splash for everybody who wants to draw but doesn't have paper. Nothing makes me feel like I'm dying more than trying to draw perfectly with a Wii Remote. We have all these- oh. 
Alright, either somebody's smoking gasoline cigarettes or people are retaliating. And for good reason, in a few short weeks, you aren't gonna be able to download Paint Splash anymore. Fuck saying that hurt! Time to get diagnosed with dart rage. Sh they got Vince Valenti to program this? From the minds behind Pong Toss Pro comes Dart Rage. It's like beer pong minus beer pong, now with darts. Now this is more like it. This must have been the Pong Toss Pro developer's true passion project. That doesn't mean it's absolutely fantastic. It's not bad, but it's not great either. It's just right. Art of Balance was always one of WiiWare's heavy hitters. I didn't personally play it when it was relevant, but it was always a title brought up when talking about WiiWare. In short, it's a physics puzzle or all about stacking shapes so they don't topple over after a short period of time. It's simple, it's easy to understand, and it's really quite a blast. Art of Balance was developed by Shinnen Multimedia, an indie team from Germany responsible for the fast racing games. So the same people who made this, made this. That f***ing terrifies me. Remember TV show King? Were you dying to see how the story concluded? TV Show King 2 is basically the developers of TV Show King saying, wait a sec, we can do better. It's fundamentally an expanded version of the first game, with even more options like having a cactus for a podium and being able to create your own questions and submit them online for Gameloft to review and possibly give to other players. I wish you could just make your own questions and use them in local play though, I, I would love that. Online has been added, but the tried and true TV Show King formula is still here. If there's anybody who screams the author of Marley me, it's Walter Cronkite. War. It's cool, right? Well, Water Warfare gives us all the joy of war, plus aquatics as well. So oh, this is cute. It's a first-person shooter for the rest of us. And by God, it's hard to land a hit on opponents. However, it does function well and stands out from the rest of the crowd on WiiWare. We really never saw a lot of full-on first-person shooters there. So hey, if you don't want your kids to play Doom, hand them Water Warfare. They'll f***ing hate you, but you'll actually be parenting. and the WiiWare service has been validated. Lead the Meerkats is a son of a bitch! Yes, the return of the WiiWare sim game with like three options to mess with and nothing more. What color do I like? Oh, fuck. You know all those times you've gone to the zoo, looked at the Meerkats and went, if only. Lead the Meerkats proves we all weren't missing out on much. The Meerkat simulation genre needs a killer app and this isn't it. After the family go-kart racing scandal, I really didn't want to stir up even more controversy, but I have to say this. Too Fast 4 Gnomes f***ing reeks. It's in the auto-running gnome genre, and it's definitely one of the best auto-running gnome games I've played in recent memory, but it's completely ruined by this. How are you supposed to differentiate what's part of the background and what's an obstacle? I'm just a gnome, you expect me to understand the difference between background art and obstacles when there's next to nothing that tells you which is one and which is the other? Well that was a solid slate of WiiWare games, uh, let's see how many I didn't care about. Damn it! That's not a great sign, because we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel of WiiWare games to look at. But it's fine, because I forgot what I was going to say there. It was stupid. Nothing is fine. The world is going to end. We Shop Channel's demise is inevitable. But at least I don't have to worry about getting brutally killed since I don't have my Wii anymore. I can't live without Leave the Meerkats, I gotta get it back! Hey all, Scott here. <gasps> I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games! I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games! I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games! You have osteoporosis. I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games. Four out of five ain't bad, but I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games! The Wii Shop Channel is gonna close for good on January 30th, 2019, and I think it's safe to say I'm set for life here. Considering people don't go ballistic and come after me because I have a Wii loaded with WiiWare games. Hey all, Scott here, and this is bad. Real bad! Huh. It really makes it easy for anybody to come in and steal the- MY NET WORTH! But at least I don't have to worry about getting brutally killed since I don't have my Wii anymore. I can't live without Leave the Meerkats, I gotta get it back! Yeah, this is officially overstated, it's welcome. I've been looking for my Wii for the past day, but it must be like way deep and 500 miles away from here, County. Oh shit, it's a Wii. This is mine! It must have been passed around the entire city. Everybody must have been fiercely playing some WiiWare games before the shop channel closed. Oh my god, what have they done to you? I'm no expert on all things abused Wiis, but it looks like this thing has been played to near death. I'd say it looks like you can play about 20 more games before it bites the dust. Let's finish what we started. Now I've talked about 101 in 1 Megamix more so than anybody else. 
I've talked about it once, so why not desperately hold on to my record by talking about it again? 101 in one Megamix blows. This was one of the games I talked about when rifling through the worst games of all time according to our friendly neighborhood Metacritic, and yes, you've heard it here twice, folks. This game is dreadful. This is a port of a DS game, and you use the pointer of the Wii Remote to do your average everyday Nintendo DS stylus things. Yeah, that doesn't work well with an IR pointer. What's easy with a stylus pen does not equal easy with a Wii Remote. On top of that, the mini games themselves... It could be better. It all culminates into this heaping pile of megabytes that is by far the lowest rated WiiWare game of all time. This is something I'll be telling my grandchildren about. Frobot was a key example of an Afro-robot based puzzle game. You control Frobot walking from room to room and effectively solving puzzles only a Frobot could solve. For some reason this reminds me of late 90s budget puzzle games for the PC. Oh, it's on the PC. And don't worry Europe. It's coming. The moment I saw this thing, I knew what was bound to come. Major League Eating the Game is everything the Wii bargain bin at Walmart was, but this time in downloadable form. First things first, this game has controls. We use them to play this game, and playing results in a win or a loss. Using the controller is the real deal with this game, and the graphics are really something on the screen. Ears? This game uses them by emitting sound, and don't get me started on having a title. This game does that, and it does it well. It's Major League Eating the Game, those five words do it more justice than I ever could. Let's your average horror puzzle game, like Catherine or Wario's Woods. It was developed by Way Forward, and these guys can truly make everything, from platformers to puzzle games to Smurfs too. Lit is one of the most interesting WiiWare releases out there, there's really not much else like it. You can only walk across lit areas of the room, and due to that you have to find ways to use objects and the environment around you to light away from point A to B. It's truly unique, especially considering it's a good old fashioned everyone tenant up horror game. Truly something we were needed more of. Video games allow you to escape from normal life, to be something you always wanted to be. With that, let's play Rock and Roll Climber. Finally. This is the last Nintendo published Wii Wear game I have, and what a way to stumble out. I can't do this. Rock and Roll Climber proved to me that rock and roll climbing is an acquired taste. So you're climbing this rock wall and you have to select rocks to plop your feet and hands on and I just can't wrap my brain around these controls. This trailer makes it look easy, but for some reason I, I can't do this. I could have gotten any other Nintendo published WiiWare game. I could have picked up Bonsai Barber. Watching this trailer is like being stuck inside with Rock and Roll Climber while everybody else is having the time of their lives cutting tree hair. Instead I'm completely stranded with this. One day into staying inside a cave and only playing WiiWare games and I'm feeling great. I packed some milk to help sustain myself so I can really take on anything. F*** this sentence. Now this is every retro enthusiast's worst nightmare. Oh yeah, pixels! Oh f 3D racing! 3D pixel racing is fucking terrifying. Why do I have to change gears? Why is MPH and RPM on the screen? It's 3D pixel racing. Why is this a driving simulator? Also, I had no f***ing clue what this game's name was for the first 10 seconds of the title screen. Oh. Now this was what you call the WiiWare game. I remember seeing World of Goo take so many Best of 2008 awards, including Best Wii Game in general some places. Keep in mind, this was the year Mario Kart Wii and Super Smash Bros. Brawl came out, so to see a WiiWare game by an indie developer be so revered was pretty wacky. World of Goo was all about making structurally sound goo bridges from one point to the next, just another Tuesday. One thing I like to see with WiiWare games is a concept that works best on the Wii console, and World of Goo is Perfect with pointer functionality. At least in terms of on home consoles, it is available on PC and mobile devices with mouse and touchscreen controls. 2D Boy and the Tomorrow Corporation are best known for World of Goo, but their other titles maintain the same cutesy but dark, morbid art style. While I played their game Little Inferno more, I still can't deny the great game World of Goo really is. When I dog on a WiiWare game, it's because games like World of Goo really show just how quality a WiiWare game could be. Fast Racing League, Shin and Multimedia spanking Nintendo for the lack of F-Zero. This was the first in the Fast series, I'm sure most people know of it for Fast Racing Neo on the Wii U and Fast RMX on the Switch. Fast Racing League is fundamentally these games with WiiWare diagnosed presentation. 
Of course, graphically, it isn't as nice as Neo and RMX, and definitely not as fast. However, this is still a prime example of a WiiWare game done right. I'm not a fan of motion controls for such fast-paced games like this, but everything still works well enough. If you liked Fast Racing Neo and Fast RMX, this is basically the same game, but older. So you should still definitely pick it up to see where it all started. Holy shit, how did I forget this is happening? Some Japanese word was a 2D shooter where the developers asked, what if Ikaruga? If you've never played Ikaruga, it's a 2D shoot em up where your ship can swap between two colors, with the color of your ship making it so you can absorb bullets of the same color, but take damage from the opposing color. Some Japanese word does that. Yeah, this is basically a poor man's Ikaruga, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. Like, it doesn't do anything that bad, it's just... Ikaruga's better? Like, look at these guys. Tell me this is better than Ikaruga. Tell me. Alongside being the name of my journal, My Life as a Dark Lord was a side game in the Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles series and is in the tower defense genre. It's actually a fairly interesting concept. You have to manage and beef up your base as more and more heroes come in and raid it. They'll get held up by enemies you place in each story of the tower, but you have to act quickly if they defeat all the enemies on the floor by placing more enemies or more floors, while ensuring you can afford them. It's actually pretty interesting, and while it gets fairly old after a while, this was one of WiiWare's more robust and solid offerings. Jet Rocket was a unique WiiWare game solely because it felt like an actual game. In a sea of meerkat leading simulators, Jet Rocket stood out as it was a 3D platformer. A pretty by the numbers 3D platformer, but hey, a quality 3D platformer nonetheless. It was developed by Shinnan Multimedia 2, and I have to say, these guys were the kings of WiiWare. They put out the most high quality bang for your buck titles on the service, and not once did they ask me to enjoy my massage. Chick Chick Boom is an interesting case of Flash Game Gone WiiWare. Similar to Cave Story, you could play this for free on your computer, but a WiiWare version was offered, and this is a personal favorite for many. I mean, look at this, how can it not be? It's Chick versus Chick, and all you have to do is outdo the other by barfing some hearty power-ups to wipe them out. Again, you could have played this for free back then, but this is a game that works pretty well on the Wii. You know, if you think about it, we don't have it that bad. Like, imagine if we were fish right now. Like, f we have it good. Rage of the Gladiators is like Punch-Out. It's not as good as Punch-Out, but it's like Punch-Out. That's not to say it isn't impressive for WiiWare. Animation and model quality is top-notch for the service, and being like Punch-Out isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just not as good. But this part was the loudest I've ever exclaimed, look at me go in my life. Racers Islands, the world is ending over this shit. Soccer Bashi, oh man, I love soccer. I love Breakout. They should just make death illegal. Mix Superstar is one of the more special games on WiiWare, considering the fact it's not a game, it's a music creation tool where you can lay down tons of crazy music to make tons of big music. The full original version would allow you to export your song to the Mix Superstar website so you could save it forever, but now all this thing is good for is making a song that consists of nothing but come on y'alls. I feel like most people would immediately dismiss this application as there's not a lot of options and it's too limiting or whatever. Yeah, this is a music creation tool for WiiWare. Professionals obviously wouldn't use it even if it were incredibly robust. This was for the young Wii user who might have been interested in making their own music, and in that regard, Make Superstar succeeded. Now, Cave Story was always one of the biggest stars of the WiiWare service. It was one of the first indie games to truly hit it big. It originally released as a free PC title and gained so much traction that Nicholas released an enhanced version on WiiWare. Now, does this excuse the fact that this was a $12 version of a free game? Well, that's debatable. It's not like the content offered doesn't hold $12 worth of value. Plus, the novelty of officially playing the game on a Nintendo console helped, but it did sting just a little bit knowing really anybody could play it for free. Which is why I never bought it for $12 on WiiWare, I bought it for $30 on Nintendo Switch. End the channel already! Fish em All is an interesting WiiWare release because it just might be the one game I have absolutely the least to say about. What do you want me to say here? Moto Heroes is one of those physics based 2D racing games. You know, kind of like Trials. This was made by the same developer. Uh, well, Moto Heroes involves everything I love about budget downloadable games from this era. 
Just quick, bite-sized, addictive arcade fun. I miss this kind of stuff. Nowadays, digital-only titles kind of feel like they're either 20 bucks and pretty high quality, or two bucks and what's the point? Well, we're 10 seconds away from the Wii Shop channel ending. If there's anything I've learned over the past 312 days, Sci Fi Rally was pretty good. The apocalypse immediately stopped after the shop channel closed down. I think everybody realized who the hell wanted to play Rabbit's Lab again. But that doesn't make the channel's closure any less depressing. The Wii Shop channel was always this magical place to go when you had nothing else to play or just got a Wii Points card burning a hole in your pocket. It wasn't a perfect shopping experience. The purchases were tied to your console and these seeing eye tests of screenshots didn't help things. But all negatives aside, this was how I could experience gaming history with the Virtual Console. How I could defy the odds of quality control and take a risk with a WiiWare game. Or just piss around with a random free Wii channel. This wasn't just a storefront with the sole purpose of showing games that are available to buy. This was the Nintendo way to do a digital shop. It's hard to believe that it's gone. I use this service all the time and it never once crossed my mind that it would be ending someday. It just goes to show how fragile digital content really is. Sure, a lot of the best WiiWare games are available elsewhere, some sometimes in physical forms, but what about the ones that will never be released outside of WiiWare? As somebody who adores everything about video game preservation, it kinda hurts to know that there will never be an official way to play a lot of these games moving forward. I mean, thankfully all WiiWare games have been backed up online, but in terms of official releases, this was it. You can't play them anymore without Nintendo giving you the stink eye. But honestly, after playing nearly a third of the entire North American WiiWare library, most of these titles are better left as the games that time forgot. The fact that I can't officially play sexy poker anymore kind of adds to its legacy, it makes the game more interesting. But for the original WiiWare games that are legitimately good and deserve to be played for generations, the Wii Shop Channel's closure is truly unfortunate. WiiWare will always be remembered as a mixed bag, we got some great titles on the service, I might never even covered. Retro City Rampage, Lost Winds, The Strong Bad Games by Telltale, The Art Style series. There was truly a metric ton on WiiWare. But considering the quality of most of the games on the service, and the fact that many of the best games are available elsewhere, have physical copies, or have been succeeded by new games that do fundamentally everything the WiiWare version did and then some, I have one final question. Was the Wii Shop channel closing worth going through this whole apocalypse? No. Hey y'all, Scott here. I've been working on my impression of Nintendo DSiWare. Watch, why the f was I born? Buying the Nintendo DSi was my first instance of being an idiot. Oh, who made it that far? Let's be fair, if Nintendo offered you a new design of something you already have with superfluous additions and crippling feature removals for nearly $200, you have to take advantage of that opportunity. This is the last time they'll do it this week. I'm not made of stone. Released on November 1st, 2008 in Japan and April 5th, 2009 over here in North America, the DSi was the third version of the Nintendo DS, a handheld that was already everybody's favorite bundle of atoms. The DS and DS Lite took the world by storm, all while being severely impaired. You can't tell me to reset the system after changing the clock and expect me to think everything's okay. Hell, you couldn't even remove a game card from the DS on the menu screen without it freezing. What's the point of having a menu screen then? I think Nintendo developed the system by candlelight. It was completely fair to expect an upgrade. I mean, you look at what the PSP was doing with its user interface and compare that to how the DS didn't even like you going into system settings. Like, I didn't even change anything. So in October, October of 2008, Nintendo announced that upgrade, the Nintendo DSi, hell-bent on being an actual system. <laughs> the future was here, and it was $169.99. Yeah, it's all right, let's get this over with. Scott was nearly 12 when he got his DSi at launch, that's why we shouldn't trust him. This was the first system I went out of my way to purchase by myself. I scrounged up the money and traded in my Nintendo DS Lite to help pay for it. I have no idea where I got that cash at that age, I guess the mutual fund worked out. But man, the thought I bought this and not something else like a PSP, an Xbox 360, PS3, anything but a revision of a handheld I already owned. But the DSi not only had one camera, it had two. Son of a bitch. There is a lot more going on with this system. One of my favorite things about the original DS was the inclusion of PictoChat on board. 
It was like a little extra bonus game you can mess around with on the road trip if the game you brought lost its luster. I didn't even use it as it was intended most of the time, you know, sending messages to friends nearby. I liked making little flip books with the thing. And it felt like Nintendo realized how popular that application was, as the DSi has all kinds of stuff to mess around with. Nintendo DSi camera lets us take pictures and mutilate them. I spent hours with this, just messing around with the special effects and whatnot. Nintendo DSi sound, likewise, I adored. You could record small sound clips or import your own MP3s with the newly included SD card slot. I mainly just recorded my own sounds and absolutely demolished them. I loved it for tampering with evidence, but overall, it added to the amount of simple fun you could have with the Nintendo DSi without even plugging in a game, mainly because the software library was cut in half. What do you call this? It was the only cake I had. The Game Boy Advance slot was removed to maintain portability. Sure. I want to lose weight. I cut off my arm. I guess the new features help outweigh the lack of Game Boy Advance compatibility. At least they did at the time. These built-in apps were loads of fun, and the Nintendo DSi had a much heavier emphasis on internet connectivity, including a web browser built in, Facebook connectivity to upload your camera's pictures, plus the main replacement for the GBA slot, the Nintendo DSi Shop. Yes, what better way to make up for stripping the compatibility of 1500 Game Boy Advance games than to give me the ability to play WarioWare Snapped? I can think of a couple. Being able to download games to your Nintendo DS was a massive upgrade. I mean, remember, those original models froze if you looked at them funny. And with the rise of downloadable software on the 360, PS3, Wii, PSP, and especially cell phones, it just made sense to go in this direction. They should have named the games that released on this thing as a good idea. Instead, they named them DSiWare. I don't know. I get it, it's Nintendo DSi software combining the two DSiWare, but they were obviously playing off of the name for Wii Digital Software, WiiWare, then had alliteration going for it. This is just a collection of letters. DSiWare games and applications were pretty much the only thing available in the Nintendo DSi shop, which makes me question why even give them a name like this. If they were offering classic games under the virtual console brand like they did with the Wii, I'd get that, you know, separate church and state. But they didn't offer virtual console titles here, which I think would have made Perfect sense. The Wii Shop channel only offered virtual console games from home systems. The DSi Shop could have had retro titles from portables, maybe even Game Boy Advance games to make up for the missing slot. But nope! It was DSiWare games or bust, original downloadable games for the Nintendo DSi. It didn't matter because I was still excited as a kid. Even without wireless internet, I was frothing at the mouth to download some DSiWare stuff. I would wander around the front yard trying to mooch off of the neighbor's internet signal. Uh, convincing my parents to get Wi-Fi was like convincing them I needed a lung transplant. I should know because Wi-Fi won out. But even beforehand, we were on vacation and the hotel we were staying at had free Wi-Fi, so I scrambled to test it out on my DSi and oh my god, sh the email! I could browse the web, play online multiplayer, but most importantly, download software from the Nintendo DSi shop. And thankfully, Nintendo included $10 worth of Nintendo points to download games. Yes, this was still back when video game companies wanted to be cute about buying digital games, with 2,000 Nintendo points equating to 20 bones. Nintendo originally called these points Wii points for use only with the Wii Shop channel, but with the introduction of the Nintendo DSi, you could use the points on either a DSi or a Wii, eventually being renamed Nintendo points. Using a point system might have been a way to avoid you having to give Nintendo a W2 for paying them so much, but hey, it worked. DSi were titles range from free to costing 12 bucks or so, and you'd find what you want on the shop by tapping through pages, two games at a time. My wife is going into labor, but... Where's WarioWare? The whole shop's aesthetic was modeled after the Wii Shop channel, and rightfully so. Both of these storefronts felt less like cold corporate marketing schemes and more so pleasant, relaxing elevators and shopping malls. Whenever I visit them, gosh, I should buy something. They even have a fun screen when you're downloading software, much like the Wii, except this one is based off of Super Mario Advance on the Game Boy Advance. That was one big final f you to the GBA slot. Unfortunately, the Nintendo DSi shop closed on March 31st, 2017. Oh. However, most of the DSiWare games released are available in the Nintendo 3DS eShop. Uh. Just looking up DSiWare, well, there they all are. Well, let's take a look at a good chunk of the releases, starting with a launch title for the DSi shop. WarioWare Snapped. He just and lost it! This was back when WarioWare was the big showcase for a new Nintendo system set of features, so here's a DSiWare title focused on the cameras for $5. WarioWare microgames that focus on using the DSi's camera is an awesome time. I'm also f***ing dumb. So Snapped has you line up your body with these outlines via the inner camera, then you play the microgames by moving yourself around. In concept, not bad, but WarioWare games generally have hundreds of microgames, all played at about five seconds apiece, getting faster and faster as you progress. It's what makes the series fun. Snapped has 20 microgames that give you about 20 
20 seconds to complete them, with each of the four characters only giving you five apiece. So we pick Wario and play his micro games, and the only challenge comes from getting the damn thing to work. So it's like playing with the photo booth application on the Mac, right? This isn't like a camera that can sense fear. No, it's just a basic camera, and even saying that's being generous. Thus, the fact they got a game like this to work at all with such horrible cameras, there's something to be said about that. I don't know if it's something good. Back in 2009, this kind of thing was pretty cute. These silly cameras were all the rage with photo booth, like I said. The iToy for PlayStation 2, eventually the Kinect for Xbox 360. It's not like there's no value at all here. There's a free tech demo pre-installed on the DSi, it's just okay. As a $5 downloadable game, it's pretty bad. As a WarioWare game, it's f***ing atrocious. You can experience the whole thing in 10 minutes. I've gotten more out of single micro games than actual WarioWare titles than this entire thing. Didn't stop me from enjoying it as a kid. I would play it in restaurants. Jesus Christ, like playing Brain Age wasn't bad enough. How about Dr. Mario Express? This was the other game I bought with my DSi shop credit, coming in at another $5, and this was a much better deal than WarioWare. Express is just flat out Dr. Mario, which you can't go wrong with on the go. I don't know, man. You ever just crack under the pressure of talking about Dr. Mario Express? There's nothing to it. It's just Dr. Mario! Not even a multiplayer mode, either local or online is included. For $5, it's sort of hard to complain, but I'm gonna try. It's a bit too obvious how little content is in many DSiWare games. I get they're incredibly cheap and supposed to be small and tiny to fit on your system digitally, but still, like, come on, you couldn't have included more in WarioWare Snapped? At least Dr. Mario Express has a good reason to exist. Pop your DSi out, play around run to Dr. Mario, throw it back in your pocket. But this entire game is just a downgrade of Dr. Mario Online RX on WiiWare. That game was $10. Why does this one have to be so stripped down? The WiiWare game didn't do anything the DS couldn't do. However, we gotta look at that their subtitle. Express was a term used by Nintendo a lot on DSiWare. Many other games used it to denote this is a smaller version of a game that already already exists elsewhere. So Dr. Mario Express was a stripped down version of Dr. Mario Online RX. Brain Age Express, Arts and Letters, Math, and Sudoku were repackaged piecemeal variants of both Brain Age and Brain Age 2. See, in PAL territories, these types of games were called a little bit of, and that's a bit more blunt as what these are. In fact, Nintendo has a pop-up warning when you buy them on the eShop asking, you sure about this? Brain Age Express makes total sense as a DSiWare game, though. This is the kind of thing you want on your system at a moment's notice. And it's not like this is just a repackaged version of Brain Age 1 and 2. It has some new puzzles, and it's mostly just a repackaged version of Brain Age 1 and 2. I can't stress how much I love to get ripped off! Uh, these versions were eight bucks a pop, and each honestly gave you more than enough content for that price. When they were just ripping content from previously released games, that's when you got decent titles on DSiWare. Clubhouse Games Express, a series of certain games from the original DS title. Master of Illusion Express was the same thing. Puzzle League Express was just playing a Puzzle League with less features and modes. Uh, same goes for True Swing Golf Express being a stripped down version of True Swing Golf, which I didn't even know was a Nintendo published DS game. Oh, well, they don't teach you in school. Then Nintendo took the DS game Electroplankton and divided it up into 10 separate DSiWare games for two bucks a pop. I'm starting to get annoyed at this strategy. Like, did Nintendo actually make anything for this? Well, that's where Mario vs. Donkey Kong Minis March again walks in. Get out. Let's just download it and oh my god! This is the image most see before death. This is a successor to Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2, March of the Minis, and the predecessor to Mario vs. Donkey Kong Mini Land Mayhem, which was followed up by Mario and Donkey Kong Minis on the move. Give up on the subtitles. You're just mixing words around. It's impossible to remember which one is which. The next one they're probably gonna call Mario vs. Donkey Kong Move Minis Move. This game is quite derivative of Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2 is a Mario vs. Donkey Kong game after all. Is there any fan of this series that goes, no, I like that one. They're all the same, but I guess Minis March Again is an improvement over March of the Minis. I mean, for starters, it's eight bucks and gives you a comparable amount of content to the physical DS game. Completely original new level designs with some new small tweaks to the flow of the gameplay. Once you tap the Mini Marios, they move indefinitely, which makes things more interesting. You have to get them all to the goal while collecting everything while in its predecessor, you could stop them and move directions. This is just more compelling. Plus you have the level editor, which is basically ripped right out of the last game, but it did give this game an endless amount of content to play through user-created stages. For $8, this was a pretty good deal. It was better than Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2. Well, I think it flat out replaced it. I think everybody can agree, this was the definitive Mario DSiWare game. Depending on your stance with Mario Clock. For $2, Nintendo was offering a clock application in case this clock wasn't enough. Yes, this was considered an application, not a game as some DSiWare titles were just that. This 
is a tool. You can set an alarm, or your clock has to be open for it to go off, dear Christ, but you can set an alarm. It's okay, why would you close it anyways? Couldn't they have included a world clock showing the times from different areas of the world? Like that calendar even, please, God, I've never wanted to see a calendar more in my life. It's frustrating because the sister application, Mario Calculator, which released the same day for the same price, has so much more to it. You can convert units, calculate fun things. Why is this so much more worthy of the $2? Well, why aren't they just a part of the same application? The 8 bit Super Mario Brothers aesthetic is fun, but doesn't amount to anything more than just funny sounds and being able to control some movement. At least you have a bit of interactivity because lo and behold, Animal Crossing clock. Who the hell do you think you are? It's just a static picture and this was $2 as well. It's the exact same as Mario clock, but with an Animal Crossing skin and the same can be said about Animal Crossing calculator, but these both aren't nearly as compelling as the Mario variants. And that's saying something, they're fucking clocks. The Mario ones have more interactivity. Animal Crossing is the bare minimum, just clocks and calculators with Animal Crossing pictures in the background. Now you can make your own town tune for the alarm sound in Animal Crossing clock. Great, not only did I spend $2, I have to supply the alarm sound for them. Nintendo also offered photo clock because what were you expecting me to? The Nintendo countdown calendar, Nintendo DSi metronome, instrument tuner. With the amount of applications Nintendo released on the DSi shop, it makes me wonder why they didn't do more. Like they could have done a ruler, maybe an email clock. While Nintendo did a few more applications, none was more tantalizing than Flipnote Studio. A free application that allowed you to make flipbook style animations. I was heard! This was an outstanding piece of software. It wasn't too in depth. I mean, you weren't gonna make a masterpiece on here. I stand corrected. But you didn't have loads of tools and colors, but you didn't need that. It's a DSi application. Give it some slack. This is a toy, and it's so easy and simple to make animations. It's incredible. I used this for hours, recording my own lines, sharing them online via the Flipnote Hatana service. This was the killer app for the Nintendo DSi. Next to Photo Dojo. Oh hell yeah! Take pictures to put whoever you want in a light fighting game. I used to love stuff like this that put my own creations on a screen where they normally wouldn't be. Photo Dojo was available for free for a short period of time before becoming $2. I don't know, man, I really need a clock. It's barely ankle deep, but for a cheap toy to put whoever you want in a fighting game, it's the most amazing thing I've seen all sentence. This was another I played a ton back in the day. Nintendo knew how to create very simple experiences that kids just eat up. It's like they're reading my mind. It's like they know what I want. Nintendo, what things do I want next? I was not expecting them to get that right. More games derived from pre-existing games. Bird and Beans and Paper Airplane Chase both were playable within WarioWare Mega Micro games and were released on their own for two bucks a pop. Uh, being high score based games, they were pretty well here. I think you'd get more playtime out of these than the actual WarioWare game on offer here. Nine Game & Watch games were put out, which I wish they had modern recreations of them like they did in the Game & Watch Gallery series on the Game Boy line. They charged $2 for each, but I would have paid five if they had a modern version alongside it. Then there was the Art Style series, various games are released on either WiiWare or DSiWare. I got art style picto bits back in the day. I still don't know. These games were very simple puzzle games, all with different aesthetics and vibes and gameplay. Again, the only one I ever played was picto bits because I will take 8 bit sprite fodder over understanding the game any day. And that wasn't all. Nintendo also released the Kappa's Trail, Crash Course Domo, Hard Hat Domo, Pro Putt Domo, Rock and Roll Domo, White Water Domo, Face Pilot, Flame Tail, Lincoln Launch, Luxie's Lineup, Metal Torrent, Number Battle, Picture Book Games, Pinball Pulse, Snap Dots, Spot Out, Starship Patrol, Touch Solitaire, Trajectile, Escape. Who the f are these guys? Let's not be hasty with criticism though, like any of us spent a day in Spotto shoes. On top of everything we already discussed, Nintendo released quite a lot of completely original DSiWare games. It's just nobody ever talks about them. I think Nintendo went a bit too light with many of their releases here. The most games were one-trick ponies. They were about one thing, doing one thing, and then doing it again for a high score. I understand why they were like this. They had the mentality of downloadable games for the DSi have to be quick, bite-sized games you can play whenever. Arcade-like experiences or just stupid dumb tech demos. Except Luxie's lineup, that's a sexy tech demo. I mean, there are standouts like Xscape, which is a successor to the Japan-only Game Boy game X, the predecessor to Star Fox. The Face Pilot, which was pretty much a Pilot Wings game on DS that you control with your face. I made an accessory. Pinball Pulse is a good pinball game. Touch Solitaire is a bad pinball game. Nintendo's output was pretty large on DSiWare, but 
inconsequential. Too many of these games felt like afterthoughts with how little there was to them. I understand creating smaller games for DSiWare was Nintendo's philosophy here, but seeing what some third parties were doing just completely put them to shame. The best developer for the platform, bar none, was way forward. The flagship DSiWare game was their own, Shantae Risky's Revenge. Unlike other games on here, this was an actual game. A sequel to Shantae on Game Boy Color, Risky's Revenge was a huge title here. It was so well designed, beautiful to look at, a great return to a cult favorite series. It was everything. And it showed that downloadable games on this system could be so much more than a cheap thrill. Games that you play for five minutes and need a cigarette afterwards? It's only roughly five hours long, so maybe shorter than most box DS games. Do you ever play Pokemon Dash? Way Forward also released Mighty Flip Champs. Keep thinking that says chimps. Followed up by Mighty Milky Way, two really solid puzzle games which eventually led to Mighty Switch Force. It's unfortunate these games don't get as much recognition as Switch Force 1 and 2, but it just shows how forgotten many DSi releases were. Like you know Steam World Dig and Heist and Dig 2 and Quest, a pretty popular indie series. The first game was Steam World Tower Defense on DSiWare. Steam World Tower Defense. I was the first person to say that this week. Caves Story was on there, that was the indie darling of the seventh generation of game systems. Uh, just cool to get games like that on the go. Uh, DSiWare wasn't a huge breeding ground for indies like future Nintendo platforms were, but at the very least it laid the foundation, it gave various developers another avenue to publish their smaller titles. But there were some big names on here, like Need for Speed Nitro X, a uh, stripped down version of a retail game. God. Damn it. I was gonna say, this is of an impressive quality for DSiWare, and now it's obvious why. It wasn't for DSiWare. Tetris Party Live, the same thing. Combat of Giants, Dragons, Bronze Edition, oh, great subtitle. Fantasy Star Zero Mini, Plants vs. Zombies, Bookworm, Zuma's Revenge, Bejeweled Twist, these were all games that just cut content from retail releases to sell them for cheaper on DSiWare, and I don't know how to feel about this. Which I need to figure out, what if somebody comes up and asks me on the street? On one hand, Hey, it gave more players an opportunity to play certain games. Maybe you just wanted to play the main mode in Plants vs. Zombies rather than all the extra junk. But these games flooded the shop. The fact they had to put disclaimers before you buy to tell you, hey, this ain't anything new. I mean, the whole thing made DSiWare feel like it was full of game demos you had to pay for. If they wanted to put a little effort into games, why not release classics through a virtual console? It makes no sense. Well, some publishers went ahead and put out their classic games anyways. The original Rayman, Earthworm, Jim, Dragon's Lair, Dragon's Lair 2, and Space Ace, a version of the Oregon Trail based on the current iPhone app at the time, were all here and accounted for. I like these ports because they give me a glimpse as to what could have almost been. Game Boy games downloadable on the DSi? <laughs> Hell, throw Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket, Atari Lynx games in there. Uh, don't tell me the DSi couldn't run them. We're talking Game Boy games, not, I don't know, Prehistoric Man or anything. Oh, you son of a bitch! I would've loved to see more classic content on the shop rather than cut down versions of pre-existing DS software. It's just, what would you rather want? Fantasy Star Zero Mini, a stripped version of an RPG? I don't even know how you do that. Or Dirty Larry. Gosh, that's tough. Let's be fair, there were original games made by big name studios. We got Dragon Quest Wars, which was a Dragon Quest tactic spin-off developed by Intelligent Systems, the Fire Emblem devs. When a downloadable DSi game is in 3D, my jaw drops. Dark Void Zero is one of the more infamous games released by Capcom in tandem with Dark Void on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. This was mockingly set up as a lost NES prequel to that game, and I think it ended up overshadowing it in many ways. Bomberman Blitz, I will describe like I do most Bomberman games, it's a Bomberman game. Frogger Returns, all right, all right, all right. I've come across this game numerous times on the Wii Shop channel and the PlayStation 3, and then they made a DSi version? Why is it Frogger Returns? When did he leave? This version is very comparable to the consoles. It doesn't have the piss ugly title screen though. So I don't know if it's worse or not. Outside of those, DSi where it didn't get too awful much. It just got awful much. Shovelware, baby! Look at this. The house game, 40 in 1 explosive mega mix, 1950s lawnmower kids. My Asian farm, I spot Japan, box busher. Ah! Spot the difference? DSiWare was full of garbage. Doesn't mean the stuff from actual publishers is much better. The more I dive into DSiWare, the more its existence perplexes me. Like, Nobody did anything with it. Nintendo decided to finally care about the service in 2011 by releasing The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Anniversary Edition after the 3DS came out and it was only available for a limited time for free. Technically, WarioWare Touch was released as a DSiWare title only in the 3DS eShop, 
only through the My Nintendo Loyalty Program. I only mentioned that so I met my WarioWare Touched quota for the day. And the final DSiWare release was in 2016, Crazy Train. There are some gems on there, but most of the time it was either shovelware or just repackaging games that were already on the DS. Like, why? I'll tell you why, because they're only human. If I ever squirt out Need for Speed Nitro, you bet I'm going in for seconds. <laughs> it ain't Easter. Oh, that's what the word October 31st meant? Wow. Some bitch you turned out to be. Really? Yeah, the house down the street was only giving out lectures. But you, you're different, giving out king-size candy bars and all? Oh, you're just trick-or-treating? I thought this was a robbery on Halloween. Nah, if this was a robbery, you'd be pointing a gun at me. Hey y'all, Scott here. It isn't Easter, it's actually not Christmas. Halloween is here, and for Trick or Treat, I'm giving away 3DSs filled with Nintendo eShop games downloaded onto them because the store was out of Skittles. And I'm just doing society a favor. First off, low calorie. Like compare the nutritional facts of Snickers to Senra and Kagura and tell me what you'd rather give to our youth. But I'm mainly doing this to spread awareness of the eShop killer an unknown entity responsible for the slow death of two Nintendo Wii shops. They're still out there. All I can do is show as many people as I can what's being lost while spreading the word. I've been tracking their patterns, analyzing their calling cards, but I still can't find the culprit. The only thing I haven't done yet is is waste my time. While I wait for more trick-or-treaters, let's take a look back at the entire life of the Nintendo eShop on both the Wii U and 3DS and analyze them to find out as much about the eShop killer as possible. But with it being Halloween, hopefully nothing scary happens. The Nintendo eShop, a digital storefront available on Nintendo systems offering downloadable software and I'll never trust somebody who looks like this ever again. The service was introduced on the Nintendo 3DS in June of 2011, was made available on the Wii U at the launch of that console in November of 2012, and debuted on the Nintendo Switch at its launch in March of 2017. But these are all separate entities. The 3DS eShop is the 3DS eShop. The Wii U eShop's the Wii U eShop. That means even with the Nintendo Switch eShop succeeding them, there is so much unique digital content exclusive to the Nintendo 3DS and the Wii U of doom. In February of 2022, Nintendo announced the death of the Nintendo eShop on both systems, making it impossible to purchase digital games for them ever again. Oh, I pissed myself this morning, I'm good. Pretty wild Nintendo decided to terminate these eShops after the whole fiasco with the Wii Shop channel closure. After the seventh US state was bombed, I thought they would have had a change of heart. Well, my neighborhood did put up a sign. But who's to say that won't eventually happen? I have to prepare for the worst case scenario. I'll use the Nintendo Wii Shop on Halloween just in case I use the Nintendo Wii Shop on Halloween. God damn, put it out of its misery. Either way, I have a Nintendo 3DS and Wii U filled to the brim with downloaded eShop games. So let's take a look at both systems' library of games that don't fucking exist. It all started with the launch of the Nintendo 3DS. And by that, I mean it didn't. While the 3DS launched here in North America in March of 2011, the Nintendo eShop wasn't active yet. We had to wait until June 6th of that year for a system update enabling the feature. It's okay, the 3DS launched with Rayman 3D. Well, there goes my product activity for the next two months. And finally, BAM! The Nintendo eShop launched. But gotta say, pretty pathetic how the system launched without a digital storefront. The Wii did, the Nintendo DSi did. This is like showing up to the party without potato salad. Sure hope nobody notices. Put some f***ing pants on! Regardless, the Nintendo 3DS's eShop was finally open for business, offering nearly all of the software from the Nintendo DSi shop outside of these games here. 
Damn it! Classic titles from previous systems a part of the Virtual Console branding, specifically Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, downloadable trailers for upcoming 3DS releases, and of course, original software and applications made specifically for the system. There are pretty much only two 3DS games on the eShop at launch. One wasn't a 3DS game, the other wasn't a 3DS game. Those being 3D Classics Excite Bike and Pokedex 3D. Now, these were both free, at least for a limited time. Excite Bike was sort of a peace offering to 3DS users for patiently not touching their handheld since launch. Pokedex was more so a 3D model viewer for the Pokemon from Pokemon Black and White. This is 100% just a polished tech demo to fiddle around with and nothing more, but I will say, the graphics did impress me back in the day, at least compared to previous Nintendo handhelds. Is that a whole ass circle? 3D Classics Excite Bike was the main course here, and it's the classic NES title remade for stereoscopic 3D. But they went even further than that, uh, putting it in widescreen, revamping the track editor, all while retaining the same look and feel of the 8-bit original. I was so damn pumped to get 3D Classics Excite Bike for free that I finally bought a 3DS for myself in August of 2011 when the offer expired and I had to buy it for $6. And that's when I discovered coping. Honestly, during this time, the classic Game Boy and Game Boy Color titles were keeping me busy. Super Mario Land, Donkey Kong, Link's Awakening DX, these games were seldom re-released, especially in comparison to the junk on NES. Hey, do you want to play Donkey Kong 3 again? Ugh, for the millionth time. Yes. Even if a good chunk of these Game Boy games didn't hold up the greatest, they were definitely fun to look back on and see how Nintendo's handheld lineage all began. Or there just wasn't anything to do with the system in 2011, because I'm gonna talk about trailers now. Something I remember doing a lot was downloading game trailers off of the eShop. This was cool because you could view them in 3D, getting a better idea as to how the game would look on the 3DS's display. But I always liked keeping these on my system, mainly because a lot of these used working titles and prototype logos, so it's kind of a cool digital keepsake from the build-up to launch for these titles. Like when Mario Tennis Open was just called Mario Tennis? Got simpler times, now the police report's longer! And that was pretty much it for the Nintendo eShop on 3DS at launch. The most exciting thing, honestly, was getting all the DSi Shop content, the Game Boy games, and of course, the presentation. You ever go to a store and feel guilty for not buying anything? I feel like that every time I enter the 3DS eShop. I mean, the music that plays isn't in your face like the Wii or DSi Shop. Rather, it's so soothing and comfy, all while that damn shopping bag has organs. No other storefronts kept me this calm during that situation. I always liked how during the download screen you could twist and turn the icon in 3D, how upgraded the entire visual experience was from Nintendo's previous digital stores. I mean, they have whole ass banners, categories, we're no longer using fake currency, which is definite growth. Sir, I'll give you seven wee cladoodles for that. Nah, now we use real world money and get taxed real world dollars because we're real world citizens now. This was the moment Nintendo fans were finally tried as adults. But that was pretty much it for the eShop at launch and frankly, almost the entirety of 2011. The only things that ever seemed to pop up here were Game Boy Virtual Console titles. Now, I'm not really one to complain. I think I react in the exact way Nintendo wants their fans to with these games. But it was just odd considering the Nintendo DSi Shop had the exact opposite issue. I thought it was weird how they had no legacy virtual console software on there, and just original DSi releases. So with the 3DS, it was pretty much nothing but virtual console software. And even then, it was basically just Game Boy. In the entirety of 2011, we only got two Game Boy Color games. More entries in the 3D Classics line released throughout the year, Xevious, Urban Champion, Twin B, and Kirby's Adventure, with Kid Icarus launching in 2011 as the last 3D Classic Nintendo release. I've already talked about these at length. However, they were a core part of the eShop in those early days. They definitely varied in quality and the games they picked to convert to 3D, I mean, damn, I was hoping they would do stick on a screen. Could have improved it a bit. Cause that's a damn branch. Outside of playing old games, however, the 3DS could do all kinds of other things. Happy Halloween. Applications. In July of 2011, we got Netflix and Nintendo Video. You know, it was kind of assumed Netflix on the 3DS would feature 3D movies. Much like how you'd assume I'm not fucking pissed. Yeah, this was just a low resolution Netflix viewer. It worked, though I remember it being incredibly slow. But if you wanted significantly less content, but content tailor made for the 3DS, look no further than Nintendo Video. This was an app that would feature four short videos at a time, all viewable in 3D. New ones would replace the old every couple of days or so, 
Uh, they weren't archived, you couldn't save them, you couldn't go back and watch old videos. You'd open up the app, could watch the four videos on hand, and the next day you'd check it out, one of those videos or all of them could be gone and replaced by something completely different. The videos could have been animations, comedy skits, music videos, movie trailers, promotions for upcoming games, whatever the Nintendo interns felt that morning. A Happy Feet 2 trailer? It was either that or my friend's dance recital. The fact there were only four videos available at a time, I can see how that made it a bit more interesting, but that pretty much meant there was no reason to stay in this app for more than five minutes. Hey, I know my flaws. This format couldn't have been sustainable, so the app was discontinued in 2015, with Nintendo opting to just release 3D videos via the Nintendo eShop. Now, many would say they went above and beyond with effort and put a vast majority of the app's previous content on there. I'm not one of those many. Nintendo Zone, another free app from 2011 I downloaded and rarely used ever at all. I was busy. Basically would allow you to go to certain stores and download specific content, like trailers and items and games like Animal Crossing. Never did that. Pretty much only open this app at home to pass time by thinking, why did I open this app at home? But then there was Swap Note, released for free in December of 2011. This was created as a follow-up to PictoChat from the Nintendo DS. That was focused on sending messages to others in the same room as you. Swap Note took things a step further by allowing you to send messages to others around the world. The amount of customization you can add to your notes makes this a huge step up from PictoChat, along with how much character is infused with the host Nikki guiding us through things. This was a really cute application. For crime? Yeah, because of the online functionality, many swap note users would find other swap note users to message via online forums. And that's how many users ended up getting horrible messages. So Nintendo's response was to just kill the app entirely, though randomly they updated it in December of 2020, calling it the Swap Note Remastered Update, which didn't do a damn thing. It was basically done just to patch things up behind the scenes to avoid hacking exploits. Why call it Swap No Remastered? I ask as if I'm brave enough to know. Well, we had apps, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and 3D Classics games all released via the eShop in 2011. What about exclusively downloadable 3DS video game software? For the whole year? Yeah, if it weren't for all the other fluff, the 3DS eShop would have had an absolutely pitiful launch year. I mean, my god! This is supposed to be the easy and cheap way to release games. Other than 3D Classics and Pokedex 3D, the first original 3DS downloadable game was Let's Golf 3D by Gameloft. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard of Wiccan Beliefs. Yeah, there's not much to this one. It's a basic as hell golf game, but I mean, I think you'd get your money out of this. Just because it's basic doesn't make it bad. Being developed by Gameloft does. But this, this is okay. Just nothing special by any means. Speaking of which, Nintendo's first major original eShop release, Freaky Forms. Released later in 2011, this game was focused on making your own creatures and trees. Finally, I can express myself. Yeah, this one was always a bit lighter. You get out of it, what well, you put into it. There's not much to do here other than make a guy and make him walk. This is one of those games I never played back in the day, but I'll see a small group of people reminisce like, God damn. That was the year of Freaky Forms. And it's easy to see why. If you really want to just dick around and make some abominations that you can then control, a Freaky Forms will appeal to you. And manipulative parents. The problem is, that's all Freaky Forms really is. It doesn't go further than, look, Ma, I made this. Oh, wow, that's great, sweetie. Please get a job. Cute little toy, but if you didn't play it during the early years of the 3DS as a youngin', it's pretty difficult to get invested in this today. Though Nintendo did release an expanded retail version later on, meaning Freaky Forms is forever physically preserved. Yeah, like these grapes. Now, I didn't pick this game up when it first launched because there was another Nintendo published eShop game released around the same time that garnered all of my attention. Pushmo, one of the best just one of the best things. I mean, this is incredible. One of the first major eShop games from Nintendo, and it's this high quality? Keep in mind, digital games around this time were always presented as far lesser than the big boy retail releases. Anything Nintendo released themselves via WiiWare or DSiWare had a distinct lack of that given a sh flavor. But here comes Pushmo, an ingenious puzzle platformer where you have to pull and push blocks in the correct way in order to get to the top. The 
concept is so simple yet has so much depth as the blocks can form pixel art, the ladders get involved, and it's controlled in 3D so you can move them from the sides or the front. There's a whole ass editor where you can make your own puzzles on top of the hundreds included in the game. Like going from Nintendo's previous offerings on the Nintendo DSi shop where you'd be damn lucky to get a title screen to this masterfully executed experience. It's jarring, but a very welcome change. It's obvious they were putting more effort into their digital offerings, making them less about being eShop games and more so just games. But hey, what about Dear God Anybody But Nintendo? Well, we have two indie games that launch in the holiday of 2011, Mighty Switch Force and Six Whole Vs. Mighty Switch Force was developed by Way Forward, a studio known for making good games when they do. And Mighty Switch Force is definitely one of them, though it does feel a bit like most of the interest in this game came from it being one of the few original eShop games at the time. The art and music are phenomenal, and the gameplay of toggling a switch back and forth to make certain platforms appear or disappear, it's simple but fun and leads to some creative level designs. But when there's only 16 stages to go through, and originally there was even less before free update added more. I don't know, it feels a little too light. It's solid, but not substantial enough for you to really go out of your way to play it. This was the perfect, I have money left on my gift card game. Now V, 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 this was pretty great. It's similarly short, but the mechanic of reversing gravity is a bit more interesting, and that Commodore 64 game aesthetic is really unique as far as retro flavored indie games go. But that was the first year of Nintendo eShop. Pretty slim pickings, but I'm hopeful. Maybe we'll get some something exciting soon, like Bye Bye Box Boy. Longest damn six years of my life. 2012 was a far more fleshed out year for the store, with the game Sakura Samurai, Art of the Sword, and Dylan's Rolling Western kicking things off in February. There was always something about Dylan's Rolling Western that just felt lame as hell. Like, oh, you have parents that love you? Well, I have Dylan's Rolling Western. A tower defense game starring an armadillo. <laughs> It is Halloween. This one is actually pretty clever with its gameplay. I do like how it takes a genre primarily known for a top-down view and turns it into a heavily character-based third-person action game. You run around the area before sunset to gather resources and prepare for enemies to show up. It's solid, albeit it can get monotonous at times. But this was a fine little eShop title, a fun one and done. They got three damn entries. He even appears in Smash Brothers as an assist trophy. Like, what did you do to earn this? I am so sorry. You know, after thinking about it, a lot of the 3DS eShop games are like this. Games with a solid base, but don't go too far with it. And they can end up feeling a bit repetitive, which is sort of my feelings on Sakura Samurai. It has tons of style and personality. The gameplay is about samurai combat, dodging and striking at the right time. But that's kind of it. It's not bad at all. In 2012, this was a must have on the eShop, but it felt more like a must have because what else were you playing at the time? Good little game by Nintendo that got really damn high review scores, like Quetzal's Corridors. This is just damn hole in the wall. Move the shape to fit in the hole. What? Like, Jesus, guys. I mean, I, I like the smaller Nintendo games as much as the guy right next to me. Don't look too deep into that. But come, why were we acting like these games were saying something profound? Now, Quetzal's Corridors is actually the sequel to Through Space on WiiWare, which we got a similar situation with Fluidity Spin Cycle. Fluidity on WiiWare was all about controlling water. Yep, video games are the best. Fluidity spin cycle takes that concept and gives it more character. Meet Eddie. He's a water. You tell your system back and forth to control where the giant puddle goes, and in some stages, you have to move the entire handheld upside down. Yeah, kind of cool idea, but in practice, who the hell wants to do this? I'd say the best Nintendo published eShop game in 2012 was from the same series as last year's. We got a follow-up to Pushmo in the form of Crashmo, the Mo series. This looks very similar, but plays a whole lot different. Basically, now blocks fall when there's nothing underneath to support them, and just that one change is enough to make me feel like an idiot. This is way harder now! It's still really damn good, but I wouldn't recommend this to somebody if they haven't already played Pushmo. Now, that wasn't it for Nintendo's eShop releases in 2012. Did we really forget Sparkle Snapshots 3D? Not yet. So this was a photo editing app Nintendo put out where you can make your pictures look like a website from the 90s. A lot of this is just something I can already sort of do in the stock 3DS camera app. So like, why would I spend $6 on this? Well, it seems that all the value is spunk based. I mean, if you really dive in, I'm sure you'd find a photo editor with more in-depth tools, but the furthest I made it was less rock sticker deep. They upgraded the Pokedex 3D application to 3D Pro containing far more Pokemon, pretty much all of them up to that point. It's a great resource for 
numbers, you even get a little Pokemon quiz you can take along with AR functionality. This is an awesome free update. Hell, I pay a dollar for it. 15 times in a row. Yeah, $15 for this is a lot, especially when you could grab two or three of the other eShop games I just mentioned for that price. And this isn't even a game. It's a resource on the way to fictional dragons. Like, $14? Maybe. It was released in the fall, alongside Pokemon Black 2 and White 2, releasing on the Nintendo DS. Pokemon Black and White already released, like, the same month the 3DS did. It just felt like Pokemon was avoiding the 3DS at all costs. Yeah. To make up for Black 2 and White 2 only being DS games, they launched Pokemon Dream Radar for three bucks. You could capture Pokemon with your 3DS camera and transfer them to Black and White 2. Oh man, apology accepted. See, the Pokemon company is just like me. They're trying to find an excuse to justify this thing. Now, a big Nintendo eShop moment in 2012 was the introduction of full-fledged downloadable retail games, starting with New Super Mario Bros. 2 being offered day and day in stores and on the eShop. Standard practice now, sure, but this was completely new territory for Nintendo at the time. Everybody forgive it up for the 45-year-old man with nothing wrong with him getting out of the chair he's been sitting in for his entire life just because he felt like it. A good handful of indie titles filled up the rest of the year, with Mutant Muds headlining it. Now this was the 3DS eShop game, one of the first I think of right alongside Pushmo. A 2D platformer where you go between the background and foreground, a concept originating from Virtual Boy Wario Land of all things, perfectly executed with the 3 display here. The gameplay is so damn simple. You just slowly walk, jump, shoot your weapon, hover in the air for a few seconds. That's pretty much it. But the simplicity isn't a bad thing. It's nice to have a game that knows what it is and takes advantage of that, offering an ultra-refined experience similar to what we got on the NES and SNES, so now with the mentality of modern-day game design. And as a player, man, I just like having some games I can always jump into and play without having to remember the controls or objectives. Mew and Muds was always a safe bet for me to pick up and play if I didn't know what I wanted out of life, and it always did the job. But its simplicity does make it harder to stand out when it's not seen as an early 3DS eShop game. This got more attention because of that. If it launched right now for Xbox, nobody would be talking about it. But see, that's the beauty of early titles in a system's life. They stand out more, and being an early adopter can inspire you to try some games you may not otherwise. Be honest. Would you? Birdmania 3D. This was always from my personal digital 3DS game collection, and the only reason it was ever notable was its insanely cheap price. Only $2. At the time, that was about the cheapest you could get on 3DS without going flat out free, and damn it, that is the best way to describe Birdmania. Outside of Birdmania. I mean, it's a high score based game that you'd find everywhere on the iPhone back in the day. The core of a fine game is there. It works and is fun enough for what it is, but this isn't the type of game that's meant to be reviewed. It's a type of game that's meant to be consumed and forgotten about after a 10 minute play session. And for two bones, I mean, it depends what you really value. Junk food or a healthy organic feast coated in pesticide. Colors 3D was another one I owned, which I got a fair amount of mileage out of. It was basically just a simple paint program, though you could use different layers to create 3D art. Get those sensors ready. It's the word f**k, I swear. Crimson Shroud was definitely one of the meteor offerings created by Level 5. It's a tabletop RPG, and that's the nicest thing I can say about it. The Dempa Men, developed by Genius, who develops a lot of the Pokemon spinoffs, They made three of them. Bomb Monkey, Art of Balance Touch, Zen Pinball 3D, Order Up, Mad Dog McCree. Uh, it, it's a boy? Yeah, cool. Definitely a step up from the eShop's first year, but that didn't stop 2012 from being the eShop's first year too. When the Wii U released in November of 2012, its very own Nintendo eShop came right alongside it. No waiting this time, everything was here and accounted for. Most retail games were offered as digital downloads, a handful of eShop only releases, though no virtual console titles yet. Uh, those would come within the next few months. This layout was definitely way smoother and less restrictive than the 3DS eShop. You could use the left or right sticks to move the page up or down, the D-pad to go panel by panel, or the touchscreen to go damn near anywhere. If we were timing this, let's just say you wouldn't be talking shit. Eventually, 
Lastly, they added this little slot machine game to play before the eShop fully loaded, featuring all the icons from the games you own. I love the loading screen game, and with how damn slow the Wii U is at times, this went from cute addition to borderline necessary. It also helps the Wii U eShop stand out as a store. And now we wait for the competition's response. Only a few games exclusive to the Wii U eShop at launch. Most notably, we got Little Inferno. It's made by the same guys who whipped up World of Goo back on WiiWare, which was often considered the best game on the Wii Shop channel. That title showcased how this development team exceeded at physics-based puzzle games. The Little Inferno is more so a physics-based puzzle toy. It's just about lighting different objects on fire and combining multiple objects to burn at once that match these little cues, and I love it. This is the perfect game for the Wii U, as you're using the touchscreen to control the fire and place items while everybody on the TV can see what you're doing. I find these types of experiences are what the Wii U does best, next to Ringworm. A Nano Assault Neo was a pretty standard shoot 'em up a Mighty Switch Force Hyperdrive Edition was just Mighty Switch Force in HD with hand-drawn sprites, which leaves chasing Aurora and trying to. With this being one of the most triple-A indie releases at the time. And you know what? That was a perfectly serviceable selection of eShop games. The Wii U's launch had stuff to play, in the same way your dad says, what do you mean there's nothing to do? The gutters need cleaned. But this was a fine enough start to the second variation of the Nintendo eShop, and moving into 2013, we were about to experience our first full year of both 3DS and Wii U digital stores simultaneously. And absolutely nothing's gonna stop us from doing so. Hey everybody, Geriatrics here, therapist at the Think Barrel. Mental health's been on an upswing lately, and therapy profits are in the gutter. So I thought I'd do my part and get a second job telling the news again. So if this report traumatizes you, thanks bud, means a lot. If you start seeing things, you know who to call. We return to this hour's update on Throat Watch. Reports of dangerous substances such as lithium ion batteries being hidden in Halloween candy have been lowered to a concerning one. Resident Resident Rex Mose can be seen here eating sh**. Wow, what I would give to be not him. And unlike somebody who doesn't have the exclusive interview with the brave cameraman who captured the whole thing, I do. Yeah, it was crazy. First thing I did, contact the news station, show them the tape. Rex Mose is now in critical condition. Detectives found this half-eaten battery on the scene leading them to the culprit. Battery acid poisoning. Lock your doors at night. Really stop labeling my stuff like that. Please! <gasps> 911! Somebody just broke in! Can we have prison outside today? Sorry, friend, no can do. Maybe this will cheer you up. Can't have a criminal without a gun. Wait, do I know you? Well, there's a good chance you gutted someone. I was right there behind you with handcuffs. No, that hasn't happened yet. Do you have a brother? Nah! Even better! Cousins! Got one that works at Target, one that's dead. I work at the police station. I'm police employee. Pleasure doing business with you. Well, I'm a convicted felon now. Might as well act like one. Now, yeah, while both platforms had applications called Nintendo eShop, while on the Wii U eShop you could look up games on the 3DS eShop and vice versa, you couldn't buy them. These were two separate entities, which like, goddamn, if they're two different stores, call them two different things. Which this just got messy. Virtual Console for Wii U was introduced in early 2013. NES games were being released there and the 3DS eShop during the same time, but they'd release the same games for both months, sometimes even years apart from each other. and they be completely separate. So Yoshi for NES launched on 3DS eShop on February 21st, 2013. On Wii U, Yoshi for NES launched on June 12th, 2013. Same exact game that you'd have to pay for all over again in full just to play on Wii U. Most of the same NES games appeared on both systems, but some only released on Wii U and others only released on 3DS. Why? Cancer exists and you're asking that? The Wii U and 3DS eShops felt significantly behind on the time. Sony had their cross-buy initiative. You buy a PlayStation 1 classic game on PlayStation 3, you got it free of charge on PlayStation Vita. Now, they did that with some indie games and even full retail releases. And they were able to do this due to the use of their PlayStation account system. One account you use across all your PlayStation devices. And in 2013, to buy a game on 3DS and then going to your Wii you only to hear it say, who the f are you? It's just depressing. I feel like Nintendo wanted to have these systems speak to each other far more than they did. I mean, I can view 3DS software available on the Wii U eShop and 
why can I do that? But eventually, Nintendo finally combined the two eShop's wallets. So pretty much, if you had 50 bones to your Wii U eShop balance, that money would also appear on your 3DS eShop. That's all it took for you? Well, when it came to actual software on the Wii U eShop in 2013, Nintendo's first major release was Google Maps. Wii Street U was a free app using Google Maps data where you could look up locations on your Wii U gamepad. Keep in mind, in 2013, this was one of only three games that released for the Wii U in February. It's just the Street View feature from Google Maps, but now with the option of moving around with the gamepad's gyroscope. For some reason, Nintendo thought this was immersive. So much so, they released a similar application a few months later, Wii U panorama view. Instead of looking up locations for free on Google Maps, this was a series of videos you had to shell out $2 a pop for. This was one of three games released in April. Why Nintendo was pushing the Wii U to do this kind of thing, I have no idea. It's not that it did a bad job at this, it was smooth and well produced, it's just you're holding a giant ass serving tray with a comparatively small screen with a low resolution. Oh, Paris. The amount of worthless applications Nintendo put out on Wii U in 2013 instead of actual video games is shocking. We got Animal Crossing Plaza, a companion app to a damn 3DS game. It was integrated with the Miiverse social media platform of the Wii U and allowed you to make posts about specific animals in the game. If any post began with, Listen. I'm just gonna say it. Run. At least this was a free app, but they took it down a year and a half later, and the entire purpose of it was nothing but questionable. So, this is for Animal Crossing New Leaf players to interact with each other on a console that can't play Animal Crossing New Leaf. Nintendo, just become a serial killer. You have the thought process of one. We got Art Academy Sketchpad for like, what, $4? It wasn't like previous Art Academy games on the DS and 3DS. There was no academy. This is just a drawing application. Pretty much Nintendo pitched it as a way to share full color drawings on their Miiverse platform, draw something in the game, share it via the screenshot functionality, which, hey, the usefulness of this app is very similar to something like Colors 3D. The problem is, this was just a demo for an actual Art Academy game that later came to Wii U. Like, Jesus Christ, did Nintendo release an actual video game on the Wii U eShop in 2013? No. Pokemon Rumble U, $18. F why not 19? This is genuinely one of the worst games Nintendo's ever released, which, hey, one of the Pokemon Rumble games had to make the list. Originally a WiiWare game where you progress through simple levels battling other Pokemon with one of two very basic attacks, Pokemon Rumble U brings things to the next level by charging $18. There are no levels, just battle arenas. You just go into a basic ring and fight a bunch of Pokemon. That's the game. This is absolutely miserable. Why it's so expensive? Oh, why it exists to begin with is beyond me. The only reasons I can think of would be to rush something Pokemon related out on Wii U, and not only was Pokemon Rumble in its normal state the easiest solution, Pokemon Rumble in a worse state was preferable. Or it was to bring these figurines to market, NFC toys you could scan on the Wii U gamepad to play with in-game. These things weren't really pushed though, so it might have just been a test thing, but yeah, I don't know. Pokemon Rumble U sticks with the Pokemon Rumble U tradition and is a piece of shit. Man, I don't know. Nintendo's Wii U eShop output has been pretty horrendous, but that all changed with the introduction of Wii Sports Club. Now it's just bad. Wii Sports Club was an HD remake of the original Wii Sports because at this point, Nintendo ran out of options. It's always felt a little more desperate than necessary to me. Like, okay, why remake Wii Sports? What did they improve? Well, HD visuals for one, the art design still uses the same incredibly basic Wii Sports style, so thank God. Oh man, Pong's in HD now. Wii Motion Plus is required for the games, which, eh. I'm just so used to how these games controlled without better motion control. Now that they have them, it's, Creepy. Golf and baseball both use the gamepad in unique ways. Golf, you set it on the floor and can see the ball. And the Wii U failed fucking why? Baseball's a bit more involved, using it as the pitcher and fielders. I'd say it's the only game that's really been enhanced by the gamepad use. The, the motion control upgrades across the board, while on paper they sound great, in practice, I always found them to make the sports more complicated and cumbersome at times. I mean, boxing is so much slower now. But hey, online multiplayer, now this was a big deal. You can finally play all the original games from Wii Sports online, and I barely ever did this, why? Well, I'm never gonna say no to having the option. I feel like these games weren't optimized enough to feel natural with online play. I mean, compare bowling here to Nintendo Switch Sports. That has everybody bowl all at once and over time eliminates players that don't meet the score threshold. While in Wii Sports Club, it's pretty much just regular bowling. You have to watch the other players do everything. And when I say everything, 
that includes nothing. But that brings us to the way they delivered this content. Wii Sports Club was a free download in which after downloading, you could play all the sports as much as you'd like for 24 hours. Afterwards, you'd have to buy each sport outright, costing $10 a piece. Of course, that meant you could opt to not purchase some sports and only pick up the ones you want. But if you want a mere taste for a day, you could pay $2 for 24 hours access of all sports. But also keep in mind that Wii Sports Club only launched with tennis and bowling in November of 2013. In December, we got golf and in June, of 2014, we got baseball and boxing and a full retail release in July for $40 containing everything. Yeah, explain that to dad. How do you take one of the simplest, easy to understand games of all time and give it the strangest pricing structure you can think of? And most people got Wii Sports for free with their Wii, so why would they want to go from that to them buying each game individually? And who the hell would get the 24 hour day pass? I get they were trying to give it a sports country club feel. I mean, it's in the damn title, but at what cost? Too much. $40 overall for a remake of a game most got for free that you could already play on the console was remade on with minimal changes or additions outside of online multiplayer, which sounds amazing, but ended up being not nearly as fun as I dreamed when playing Wii Sports on its heyday. I'll still buy it, but still! Thankfully, Nintendo ended 2013 with a bang on the Wii U eShop. Two games released right around the holidays. First up, NES Remix. Announced and released on the same day, this was an amazing little surprise that recontextualized classic NES games as bite-sized challenges. Unfortunately, some of these challenges would just be tutorials. Kick the turtles. Oh no, my ass! I've worked it off! But it's addictive to go through as many challenges as you can and try to get the best rank possible, Rainbow Stars. Though I think what NES Remix does best is actually make some of these games fun in a modern day setting. There's no human reason to play NES Baseball anymore, but in the form of a challenge mode where you still get to play the game, but in a more abridged fashion, almost like playable highlights, it all makes sense. It makes these games as fun as they were back when they released. Now, of course, just browsing around the menus, it's Flair Nintendo position positioned NES Remix as a bit of an advertising tool, making sure the players know they can buy the full games on the Nintendo eShop. But this element is definitely underplayed and never overtakes the experience. This genuinely feels like an ingenious method of making outdated NES titles cool again. But of course, the star of the show is the Remix challenges, though I'd say these are pretty hit or miss. Sometimes these are as cool as playing Donkey Kong as Link, but because you're Link from the original Legend of Zelda, you can't jump. So not only is it wild to play the game as a different character, but they keep an attribute of that character to increase the challenge. But other times, the remixes are basically just adding a filter to the game. When they hit, they really hit, but I find a lot of them to have too minor of tweaks to be really that cool. But when it comes down to it, NES Remix was exactly what the eShop needed. Something familiar, yet incredibly fresh and fun. And for only 15 bones, I'd say this was the one eShop game that belonged on everybody's Wii U. But on New Year's Eve, that number increased by zero. Dr. Luigi, a new entry in the Dr. Mario puzzle series featuring Luigi because, well, we weren't feeling bad enough for Nintendo. So Dr. Luigi was created in commemoration of the year of Luigi, Nintendo's worst financial year. A year long celebration of Luigi's 30th anniversary. Yeah, why not let him diagnose me? Of course, on the last day of 2013, you kind of actively date your game by having Dr. Luigi stand on a giant year of Luigi podium, but it doesn't really matter because all Dr. Luigi is, is Dr. Mario on the Wii U. You could have a giant banner at the top that says, congratulations on becoming a state, Wyoming. And it wouldn't matter because it's just core Dr. Mario gameplay. You pop in, play a quick game, pop out. So I don't think dating this game with the year of Luigi makes it unplayable. The fact it's the same damn game from WiiWare does. Dr. Mario Online RX was a fantastic little WiiWare game for 10 bucks. Then five years later, Dr. Luigi releases for $5 more, introduces a mode with L-shaped pills, and the color green. Yeah, I gotta be honest, this is a pretty pitiful follow-up to all the Dr. Marios before. This is literally just Online RX, but in HD, with this new mode. Operation L. Instead of matching up a pill with two colors to the viruses in the bottle, and now you have to deal with an L-shaped pill. 
God damn, who gives a sh**? This doesn't change the game. If anything, it just makes it easier because you have more pills. You have more chances to clear all the viruses. A lot of the music is reused from Online RX. The rest of the modes are. This just always felt like a fairly passionless project. I mean, it's cool that the viruses here have new designs and this virus buster mode returning from the WiiWare game plays differently, focusing on using the touchscreen of the gamepad. But it's not enough. This just feels like it was put together with not much thought at all. It's a completely competent modern Dr. Mario you experience, but that's the only reason why I ever booted it up, because I just felt like playing Dr. Mario. I'm not perfect. And that was Nintendo's Wii U eShop output in 2013. Does anybody else feel itchy? I'll leave it up to the third parties and indies to pick up the slack. I'd say Toki Tori 2 was one of the big headlining indies this year. I mean, a sequel to a late release Game Boy Color game exclusively on Wii U? It's a shame because Doki Tori 2 is a great little puzzler with loads of charm, and they also put out the remake of the original game on the eShop that very same year. It's always heartwarming to see developers really get behind certain consoles and create their games exclusively for them. It can help out, as in the case of Toki Tori 2, that was one of the only original games that released on the Wii U in April 2013, and even if the game has released on numerous platforms since, I always see it as a Wii U game. But it is so risky to do that, especially for such a niche series like Toki Tori. And some games, as much as I associate them with Nintendo and the Wii U as a whole, did release across multiple platforms, which was for the best. BitTrip presents Runner 2 Future Legend of Rhythm Alien, a great auto-scrolling rhythm platformer succeeding the BitTrip series on WiiWare, specifically BitTrip Runner. You know, there's not much to say outside of how addicting this game can be, and it's great to see how Runner 2 breaks free of the Atari 2600 styled graphics of the original BitTrip series. As while well, that was unique, especially compared to how other retro-esque games would almost always tackle NES-style 8-bit at the time, it was for sure limiting, and you can only take the series so far with those types of visuals. And while that original series was exclusive to WiiWare for the longest time, Runner 2 launched on PC, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and Wii U, which was definitely smart for the developer. Though, this was always a Wii U game to me, much like DuckTales Remastered. DuckTales on NES by Capcom was always seen as this legendary title, one of the greatest on the console, setting the standard for licensed games based on cartoons. But because of that exactly, it was never re-released. Licensed games are just trickier to do that with. But thankfully, we got something even better as Capcom, Disney, and the developer Way Forward came together to fully remake the game. Now with these beautiful hand-drawn sprites, 3D backgrounds, remixed music, and fully voice-acted cutscenes. I love this game. In my opinion, it takes the iconic original and makes it so much better. The controls, the level design, the boss fights, they tweak things to make everything flow a bit better as a modern game, while still respecting the original and maintaining what made it so great. Glomberry Kingdom was another multi-plat release, this one published by Ubisoft. It's a 2D platformer with procedurally generated stage design, meaning every time you play, the game will auto-generate a new level, meaning you will always have new stages, and they will always be very mediocre. I mean, this is a fine little download title. I had it on the Xbox 360 and thought it was decent enough to waste some time with every now and then. But it was no Mutant Muds Deluxe, which is Mutant Muds again, and only Mutant Muds can claim to be that. This release has a bunch of extra levels and adjusted visuals due to the lack of a 3D display, but other than that, it's Mutant Muds. It's a good little platformer, but I want something unique to Wii U. And horny. <laughs> and horny. Spin the bottle, Bumpy's party. Oh sh! They got Bumpy in on this. One of the most unique Wii U games, honestly. A local multiplayer-only joint that barely uses the TV at all. It's all about huddling around the gamepad and using it to do all kinds of stupid things, like play Spin the Bottle, Bumpy's party. It's honestly pretty damn close to something like One Two Switch on the Nintendo Switch, where most of the fun comes from interacting with the other people in the room, while the video game portion is more so in the background, encouraging that kind of behavior. I'd say this is a pretty alright party game to have. Without children in the room, how is this rated everyone? The, the past the badger? Zen Pinball 2, Castle Storm, Mighty Switch Force 2 launched on Wii U a few months after debuting on 3DS in summer of 2013, uh, this time retaining the pixel art style opposed to the hand-drawn style of Hyperdrive Edition. We got The Cave by Double Fine and Sega, a Dungeons and Dragons Chronicles of Mistara, an old-school arcade game by Capcom brought back to modern platforms, Gianna Sisters Twisted Dreams, it was apparent there was a decent enough amount of stuff to play on the Wii U eShop throughout 2013. 
but it was more apparent what wasn't there. Soul Calibur 2 HD released on Xbox 360 and PS3. This game was infamous for having exclusive characters for each console it released on, with Link from The Legend of Zelda in the GameCube version. I mean, talk about a missed opportunity not putting this out on Wii U and bringing Link back. And we didn't get other games that released on PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade, like Call of War as Gunslinger, Darkstalkers Resurrection, Retro City Rampage, which got a damn WiiWare release, but not on the Wii U eShop. So what did the Wii U eShop get? They should have killed it sooner. The Nintendo 3DS eShop in 2013, by comparison, you know what, I can live with this. Nintendo kicked things off this year with Tokyo Crash Mobs, just like me. So this is the game that's all about being wacky. It's a reskin of the puzzle game Magnetica, which is a reskin of Ballistic, which is a reskin of Puzzle Loop, but this takes place in Tokyo. Well, not saying this didn't, but. Yeah, I've always heard of this game, but never tried it. I assumed it was going to be anything but a Zuma clone. I also assumed melanoma was the sleeping hormone, so. Sploosh. You throw a rock down a well. And it's still better than Pokemon Rumble. I actually had this one back in the day. It was pretty cheap in a basic high score based game. I tried to get the rock down there as fast as possible, hitting the least amount of obstacles. It was fine enough for what it is, but for me, in 2013, it was all about Harmonite. Created by Game Freak, the Pokemon developers, Harmonite is very similar to a game like Runner 2. It's a rhythm game presented in the context of a platformer. You have to jump and attack at the right time to keep the beat. I loved the presentation, the character designs, and the feel of hitting a note was exhilarating. But after replaying this, you know what sticks out? Not the music. For a rhythm game, this title has some extremely forgettable tunes. None of it is bad, but it just feels weird for something like this to not really prioritize the soundtrack. Though there's some Pokemon music in there, which is nice, and overall the game is still quite good. I love to see Game Freak spread their wings and do something non-Pokemon related from time to time. But damn, Harmonite never got a sequel, which is something Dylan's Rolling Western can't say. The Last Ranger. I am genuinely asking. What do you want me to say? The only other Nintendo published 3DS eShop game of 2013 to discuss, that's right, they were a bit lighter this year, is Mario and Donkey Kong Minis on the Move. So this is an entry in the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series, but who know that? I guess they changed it to Mario and Donkey Kong to signify how this title plays pretty much completely differently compared to the other entries, but you could also say that about Mario vs. Donkey Kong 1 compared to the games that followed. Regardless, that series became this whole stinking heap of nothing. Just the same puzzle platformer ripoff of Lemmings over and over again. This one here is just a ripoff of Pipe Dream, and I am so happy because of it. Your mini toy starts following the directions of the tiles, and you have to place new ones in a correct order to get them to the end. It's not the most original idea, but damn it, it's executed well, and the production values are great here. I'm really bummed they didn't continue with this idea, and instead decided to go back to hell where they belong. But we'll get to that in due time, because while Nintendo's output here was light in 2013, we got some heavy hitters from the other studios namely Capcom, with Phoenix Wright Dual Destinies. Yeah, unfortunately, this was an eShop exclusive, digital only. It got a physical release in Japan, but nowhere else. It's a shame, because this is a fantastic evolution of the Ace Attorney series. It brings the iconic pixeler into full cel-shaded 3D, and it looks outstanding. Standing. Weirdly enough, this was the first game in the series to be rated M, just for a bit more blood on screen than usual. It's like, come on, was this really necessary? I mean, in the end, being an eShop exclusive is not as difficult to buy if you're too young compared to at the store. Who cares if it's 17 and up? Surely no one. Ah, the first of the Senran Kagura games launched as an eShop exclusive here in North America in 2013. Oh man, Target didn't want this. The Picross E series launched in 2013, at least here in North America. Listen, I love Picross, but like, f**k. You own one of these, you're good. Gunman Clive was a cheap little Mega Man-like game. It's similar to many eShop games where, like, if this wasn't cheap on a handheld without too many games releasing for it all the time, it wouldn't stand out as much. Not to say it's a bad game, not at all. I just remember this being labeled as one of the 3DS eShop games. Like, it's just fine, okay? Nano Assault EX was an updated version of a 3DS game that launched physically in 2011, so the enhanced version was strangely digital only. Bugs vs. Tanks! Which side are you on? I know I play as the military, in the game, but I'll wear my heart on my sleeve. I had a dream like this once. Attack of the Friday Monsters of Tokyo Tale is definitely quite a lot better. This is an oddly nostalgic feeling experience. It feels so genuine and heartfelt with a unique car battling mechanic. Jet Rocket 2, a sequel to a WiiWare game, 
fine. It's a more than basic 2D, 3D platformer hybrid, which was cool on WiiWare because that was really pushing the boundaries there. But on the 3DS eShop, I mean, 3D games were more and more common, so this isn't nearly as cool. However, a big standout on the 3DS eShop was the Sega 3D Classics line different from Nintendo's from earlier, this was something Sega did on their own accord, and they pumped out so many more titles. Most of these were fantastic. And just the fact that Sega put out considerably more games than Nintendo, yet they all included more features than the Nintendo 3D Classics ever did, it just makes me ask, why the hell did it do Urban Champion? But to wrap up 2013, easily one of the eShop games of the year, Steam World Dig. This kind of came out of nowhere. Most people didn't even know this was a follow-up to a DSiWare game, Steam World Tower Defense. But when this hit, it was an instant must-buy for so many 3DS owners. Well, Officer Steel Wool, what do you think? Should we let him go? Eh. What the hell? Oh, come on, I was giving away 3DSs. It wasn't like I was putting straight up poison and candy. That would actually put you in better standing. Poison just got approved by the FDA. Damn, society is accelerating too fast for me. Damn. Wait, what if I can help you guys out with a case? I'll need some time, but I can figure out who the Nintendo Wii Shop killer is. Fantastic. Keep this up and we might lower the severity of your charges. Knock you down to death row. 2014 can be considered a year of many things. NES Remix 2, Pushmo World, and the lack of anything else to talk about. Yeah, looking back at the Wii U's life, it truly does feel like 2013 was the last year Nintendo really tried with that system. 2014 and 2015 may have had some big releases, but the general energy around the console did not feel optimistic for the future. And something that may have contributed to that was the lack of Nintendo published eShop content. The Wii U primarily just received virtual console titles and indie games. 2014, we really only got two original games from Nintendo themselves, starting off with NES Remix 2. Yeah, they wasted no time creating a follow-up to the original, this one being revealed just two months after the first was announced and released. Though NES Remix 2 was first shown in February and then launched in April. I feel like that kind of deflated the excitement for me. I mean, NES Remix is not the type of game you can hype up for months on end. Like, damn, did you see the leak? But this one was definitely quite a bit more interesting considering the game lineup. Oh wow, actual video games. Where's Schoon? That means Super Mario Bros. 2, 3, Zelda 2, Metroid, Kid Icarus, Kirby's Adventure, Dr. Mario, and some of the greatest games on the NES, all featured in NES Remix 2. That alone makes this entry far better than the first. You'd think. I'm of the opinion that the simpler and worse games featured in NES Remix worked better with this challenge format, or at the very least, the games themselves benefited from being here. Yeah, Mario Brothers controls like ass, but that makes conquering 10 second challenges actually pretty fun and rewarding. Most of the flaws with these games don't get on my nerves in NES Remix because of how quick these are, and these older titles being this simple make them naturals for bite-sized missions. Plus, being playable in this way makes it easier to experience these titles in a modern context. NES Remix 2, the games all have more depth, they're more complicated, and thus, they are far better, but it's sort of a double-edged sword because, well, yes, the games here are great, part of me would just rather play the actual games themselves. You can't tell me you had that problem with the first game. It kind of makes the more filler challenges, like hold the B button and watch the demo, that much more irritating. Like, NES Remix 2 does have a slightly smaller number of challenges than the first game did, and you still include this? I do feel like the quality of challenges across the board have improved though, especially with the remixes. These have seen a noticeable improvement with far more character from this game and that game moments, which are always a blast. A ton more wacky ideas that feel like legitimate remixes rather than Photoshop filters. They also included Super Luigi Brothers, the full Super Mario Brothers game, but played backwards with Luigi. It is pretty wild how much a simple mirror mode can alter any game. Oh, f And Super Mario Brothers is no different. This is a cool little bonus. But the main attraction here is the Nintendo World Championships Remix, a mode that unfortunately only appears if you own both NES Remix 1 and 2. Why can't we all just get along? I would totally buy this as its own separate game, going through Mario, Mario 3, and Dr. Mario in roughly six minutes, trying to get the highest score possible to end up seeing how you rank on the leaderboards. This is what I did the most in NES Remix 2, along with chipping away at the dozens upon dozens of challenges. This was great fun, and while I always appreciated how NES Remix one took outdated and frankly bad titles and made them fun. In the end, the second volume is definitely better than the first, which that's the best way to describe this series. 
Remix 2 volumes of one big thing. NES Remix 2 is basically if NES Remix 1 kept on going. Same setup, user interface, everything. And with how quickly this released after the first, it was natural for fans to expect an NES Remix 3, 4, SNES Remix, and 64 Remix. And by June of that year, we finally got that. They just named it something weird. Pushmo World, another installment in the Mo series. Though this one reverts back to the original Pushmo with its gameplay mechanics. I mean, it's still really damn good, but there's not much to say outside of it's an HD Pushmo. It is a brand new game. It's not just the original 3DS entry on Wii U, but it might as well be. There's nothing distinctive about this one outside of it's in HD now. Why not add a multiplayer mode or something to take advantage of this being on a home console? In the end, yeah, I like this, but there's really not much else to say. It's another Pushmo on Wii U, that's it. Which, hey, that would have been perfectly fine, but man, the list just ended. That's if we don't include Japan exclusive eShop games. Interestingly enough, Nintendo released free software titled Nintendo Game Seminar 2013. This is a collection of four small games created by budding game designers during an event Nintendo would hold to teach how to make games just like the greats. There's not much here to write home about. These are very simple titles created within a small amount of time, but it's absolutely wonderful to see them compiled and officially released this way, even if it was only in Japan. And you know what? If we're counting that, I'll count this. All right, Nintendo released Pikmin Short Movies HD on the Wii U eShop in November of 2014, alongside Pikmin Short Movies 3D on the 3DS eShop. Oh, well, this makes up for the months of neglect. So they decided to make about 20 minutes worth of Pikmin animation, and they released the content via these apps, which are basically just video players. Nothing too special here, though it is rather cool how the 3DS version displays the shorts in 3D. The animations themselves are really cute little vignettes of Pikmin life. They show how well some of Nintendo's characters and worlds can work outside of gaming, and the fact that Nintendo eventually purchased the production company responsible for the animation here proves that they thought so too. They didn't think they had to support their damn eShop though, but it didn't matter because 2014 was a huge year for indies on the eShop. This was when Nintendo fully accepted, yeah man, shit's f***ed, and wholly embraced independent developers, really pushing them in their Nintendo Direct presentations and also netting the biggest indie game, hell, one of the biggest games of 2014 as a console exclusive. Shovel Knight was a crowdfunded love letter to some of the most iconic NES classics while aiming to do its own thing rather than be a parody. It contains elements reminiscent of DuckTales, Zelda 2, Mega Man, Super Mario Bros. 3, Castlevania, but Shovel Knight makes it all its own. Something I always respected was how Shovel Knight never references anything. Nobody in the game says it's dangerous to go alone or your princess is in another castle. That helps Shovel Knight feel like it can stand toe to toe with the games that inspired it rather than forever live in their shadow. Outside of the widescreen presentation and increased color palette and detail, this feels like it could have been straight from that 8-bit era. But that shows off how Shovel Knight isn't afraid to take the best from both retro and modern gaming and create one of the tightest designed experiences of the 2010s. The gameplay? Immaculate. It can't be overstated how ingenious the checkpoint system is. You can pass through these as normal checkpoints or you can destroy them for extra cash. Though they won't work as checkpoints anymore. Like, that is my go-to method to ask where it all went wrong. The controls are perfect. The levels are masterfully crafted. The world and characters feel so genuine. It's easy to see how this was considered one of the best 2014 had to offer, and it was only on PC, Wii U, and Nintendo 3DS for the first year. The 3DS version is incredible. Stereoscopic 3D, everything looks so crisp on that tinier display, and after playing the game on a home console, having it in its entirety on the 3DS just feels damn cool. Shovel Knight later went on to become almost a mascot for independent game development, making numerous cameo appearances in other games, even Smash Brothers. Same level. The game went on to receive a physical release in 2015, various amiibo figures, and when crowdfunded, the developers promised multiple playable characters and extra campaigns that they continue to update the game with for the next five years for free. Yeah, in 2019, Shovel Knight on Wii U and 3DS received its last major update with a brand new single player campaign in multiplayer fighter side mode. I honestly think it's unfair to compare this to how other crowdfunded indie games released because they knocked everything out of the park here. Like back during the Kickstarter, I doubt anybody expected four unique campaigns in a Smash Brothers mode with all these characters when they promised them as stretch goals. Playable boss night, battle mode, that's all these were ever meant to be and I always assumed they were just gonna be small little bonus side things but developer Yacht Club Games did the unthinkable. 
they didn't make Meme Run. 2014 may have been the year Nintendo fully embraced indies. There's a dark side to that. See, at the beginning of this generation, Nintendo was still a bit picky on what would be allowed on their platform, stopping games like Binding of Isaac from coming to the 3DS due to the offensive religious imagery. <laughs> but they allowed this and it has the same damn thing. The entire point of this game is how silly it is to see on a Nintendo platform. Outside of that context, I'm not really sure if it works. Hey, did you see my joke last night? That wasn't a joke, you just didn't flush the toilet. Meme Run is an auto runner where you jump and slide through internet memes. It was delisted a few months after launch due to the unauthorized use of said internet memes. Interesting considering the developers stated the game failed Nintendo's approval procedure multiple times. I don't know, I feel like the makers of Meme Run think it's funny to not play by the rules. Yo, I punched a fucking baby in the face. They just let me do it. And one of the biggest names on the Wii U eShop this year was Batman. Okay, okay, we'll get to that. Arkham Origins Blackgate Deluxe Edition, a port of the 3DS and Vita game. The Batman Arkham series got a lot of support on this platform. Next to Skylanders and Just Dance, it might have been the most frequent third-party series. What would their conversation be? F1 Race Stars came to the system as an eShop exclusive, and this being an Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 retail game from 2012. That already happened with Fist of the North Star Ken's Rage 2 in 2013, a game that was produced and probably envisioned as a full retail release relegated to an eShop exclusive more than likely due to sales projections of, uh, hmm, uh, no. <laughs> but don't worry, this isn't the last we'll see of that. I wish. SteamWorld did got a Wii U release this year, alongside Art of Balance, Guacamelee Super Turbo Championship Edition, Tesla Grad, Costume Quest 2, Stick It to the Man, Swords and Soldiers, It'll Do, The Fall, The Swapper, Another World 20th Anniversary Edition, Thomas Was Alone, and Pure Solar, which was originally a homebrew Sega Genesis game, brought over to modern platforms, which is pretty neat. A World of Keflings, which was originally an Xbox Live Arcade title on Xbox 360, published by Microsoft, released on Wii U, which was strange. I mean, this game went nowhere else. Basically, all these games that didn't initially launch on Wii U, but got a port this year, just like Shantae and the Pirate's Curse, barely. Launching on 3DS in October of 2014, then by Christmas it launched on Wii U. Pretty quick turnaround, and that's a good thing, because the more people who could play this game, the better. In this case, it's one. Shantae and the Pirate's Curse was a big deal for eShop goers. In the title that preceded it, Shantae Risky's Revenge was considered the best damn thing on DSiWare. Though I was confused at the time due to developer WayForward launching a Kickstarter for Shantae Half Genie Hero in 2013, the first Shantae game on home console to be released in 2016. You know what? To tide you over until that, here's the first Shantae game on home console in 2014. To be fair, Half Genie Hero was to be designed from the ground up for consoles with HD hand drawn visuals while Pirate's Curse is more so just a 3DS game ported to Wii U. But hey, this is the kind of support Wii U needed. Not Scram Kitty and his buddy on rails. This was a Wii U exclusive originally, so Nintendo had to market it. It's fine, I, I mean, it's pretty unique being a mix between a platformer, shoot 'em up and twin stick shooter. It's just one of those games that you know nobody would care about if it released today. But here it was, in the same Nintendo Direct presentation as Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, Xenoblade, Bayonetta, Scram Kitty! 1001 Spikes was better because of the price point alone. Saw a little tough as nails retro platformer launch day and day across all platforms, including Wii U, and 3DS. Damn, it's like this is a real console. Our Milo stayed exclusive to Wii U and PC, basically out of admiration for how Nintendo treated independent developers. F you, Sony. Sports Ball was a local multiplayer only Wii U exclusive, basically the arcade game Joust with balls. And of course, Child of Light. Launched on Wii U day and date with the other platforms, a smaller downloadable title by Ubisoft, and probably one of the highest quality eShop games to date. Seriously, look at this game. This is a Wii U eShop release, just like this. You can't say the Wii U didn't have variety. The 3DS had a bit of a slower year on the eShop in 2014, obvious by the fact it started with Steel Diver Sub Wars, Nintendo's first free-to-play title. They were already experimenting with different pricing strategies like with Wii Sports Club, but this was structured like other free-to-play titles where the online multiplayer is available to all who download, while other elements, specifically most of the single-player content, is locked behind a paywall. It always felt like Nintendo sort of just did this to tell their investors to shut the hell up! They were constantly pushing Nintendo to do this sort of thing. Join the mobile game space, put your games on dear god anything without two screens. So Nintendo said, fine, we'll make a free-to-play game. <gasps> on the 3DS. <gasps> based on Steel Diver. 
Yeah, the 3DS launch title by Nintendo about submarines. Look, everybody, it's the guy who gave a shit. Where'd he go? I had choice to make a follow-up, but when you're looking to experiment with free-to-play, why not experiment with a franchise you have nothing to lose with? Sub Wars didn't hook me at all, but it's for sure more interesting than the original Steel Divers, simply due to the fact it's in first person now. But overall, I couldn't really care less about this one. Though, in contrast, things can't be further from the truth about Nintendo's other free-to-play offering this year. Rusty's Real Deal Baseball is this amazing hybrid between a sports arcade minigame collection and visual novel. It's all about talking to Rusty, who owns a baseball video game shop. You want to butter him up by telling him what he wants to hear, giving him items that make it easier to haggle the prices of the games you buy. Yeah, since this is a free download, you can play it for a bit, but afterwards you have to purchase the rest of the games with real-world money, though the real-world price you pay is dependent on how much you can haggle with a dog. This is still one of the most unique implementations of in-game purchases. Uh, sure, the haggling is scripted, there is a limit to how much Rusty is willing to go down, but you can decide whether to keep pushing for a lower price and use discount coupons you earn playing the games, or say, you know what, he earned this. The games themselves are really simple, but quite addicting and fun, even though 100% this wouldn't be for everybody. While I think the pricing structure is pretty cool, others may find it insulting. I still feel that this is one of the eShop's greats. Even when forced into a corner to conform to industry trends, Nintendo still finds a way to be Nintendo. And then there's Pokemon Battle Troze. Sequel to this DS game, which the only thing I can really say about is I like the box art. This looks really modern for a 2006 DS game, you know? This is pretty much like any other icon-linking puzzle game you'd find on a smartphone, but it does bring over the strategy of the mainline Pokemon series. You link up the icons of a certain Pokemon, it'll do an attack to the Pokemon on the top of the screen you're battling against. And because certain types of Pokemon are weak against other certain types of Pokemon, you can keep that in mind to defeat your enemy quicker. I don't, I just move the funny pictures around. It's hard to criticize a game like this when it was always meant to be just there. Do you really think the game developer said, we're about to change the goddamn world? It's fine for what it is. If you wanted to play a puzzle game, you could do worse than this. It's just kind of shockingly bland for using the Pokemon license. The boring backgrounds, generic animations and menus, it's just one of those games you question how you're spending your time when you play it. Like these two games, Kirby Fighters Deluxe and DDD's Drum Dash Deluxe. These were sub games featured in Kirby Triple Deluxe, now re-released on their own for seven bones a pop. Why stop there? Could you offer that game's menu for five? Listen, I'm not opposed to the idea of taking these mini games and expanding upon them for a full-blown eShop release. I just don't think they did that. DDD's Drum Dash is a pretty fun little rhythm game, but there's just not enough content here in my opinion to warrant this being its own release. I beat the whole thing in under an hour, and sure, you may want to go back and get high scores, but I don't. Kirby Fighters Deluxe is a similar story, though I feel this works better as a standalone thing if you just want a cheap Smash Brothers clone on 3DS. But these reek of what Nintendo used to do on DSiWare, They'd chop DS games up and offer them as smaller downloadable titles. like. Yeah, I see the strategy and a bit of the appeal back then. It was nice to have these slices of games always available on your system, but when you straight up are offering retail games on the eShop for download, this whole thing is starting to fall apart. But here comes Chibi Robo Photo Finder to save the day. And Nintendo resurrected Chibi Robo! Ah! Yep, so Chibi Robo is back after a hiatus lasting a few years. This game still controls similarly to previous entries, though now focuses on taking photos, three years after the 3DS launched. Yeah, you can't really make a game focused around this thing in any year that doesn't end in 11 or 12. It's just not a good camera, and by this point, nobody was being wowed by anything on the 3DS other than games that were just flat out good games. You focus on making a game surrounding the 3D effect, the gyroscope, the AR, the camera, n nobody's gonna care at this point. So yeah, this game did not deserve this kind of reception, but it is damn obvious why it got it. Didn't stop Nintendo from holding a Chibi Robo photo contest. You could get this Chibi Robo Wii U by playing Chibi Robo Photo Finder. If anything, you're scaring people off. Inazuma 11 finally made its way over to North America this year as an eShop exclusive, a soccer RPG by Level 5. It just won't stop in Japan and Europe, but it did on its first try over here. Retro City Rampage DX on 3DS. That was cool to see, especially because they still refused to do a Wii U version. 2048, crank the f***ing 3D up. Moon Chronicles was a remake of the original DS game Moon, being released episodically now, plus having the audacity to be one of the only first-person shooters on 3DS. Good for it, that's awesome! That's also precisely why I was never interested. Azure Striker Gunvolt released, the spiritual successor to the Mega Man Zero series. That was an incredible 2D action game. That interestingly launched alongside a companion title, Mighty Gunvolt, a crossover between it and the upcoming Mighty 
number nine. This was during the great Mega Man drought of the 2010s, so getting a classic Mega Man-like experience on top of a Mega Man Zero-like experience on the same day by the developers of both the Mega Man 9, 10, and the Zero series with Mighty Gunvolt featuring the protagonist of the upcoming Mega Man spiritual successor, well, the rest of it was good. Whoa, Dave and Zeo Drifter were nice little indie releases, but other than that, it was a bit of a softer year for 3DS, with Wii U getting some more attention. And with Epic Dumpster Bear releasing soon, it better pick up the pace. I love all Mario vs. Donkey Kong Tipping Stars games that released in 2015. Well, not that one. Releasing on both Wii U and 3DS at the same time, this was Nintendo's answer to Sony's cross-buy initiative. Finally, I can get a game on Wii U and I'll get it for 3DS as well, free of charge. Oh man, they were so nice. When I took the moldy bread, they gave me the puddle of vomit for free. Listen, the Mario vs. Donkey Kong games are all completely edible. They work, they'll fill you up, but man, like, I don't want lasagna again. Tipping Stars is the exact same damn game as Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2, March of the Minis, Mario vs. Donkey Kong Minis March Again, Mario vs. Donkey Kong Mini Land Mayhem, except now, it's the game we're talking about. The core gimmick of this game is how, while there's a campaign of levels to play through, you can create and share your own online, which has been in all the other Mario vs. Donkey Kong games, but this one, you can tip the creator's stars. God damn, somebody name a game after that. These games are interesting to talk about, considering I'm not really sure how much here you can truly criticize outside of its existence as a whole. Like these are fine, well-designed little puzzle platformers, but when you make like nine of them and they're all so damn similar, you don't see a genuine evolution take place. And when you finally make something worth a damn, you and relapse. And this is $10 more than Minis on the Move? I get you receive both the 3DS and Wii U games, but if that was factored into the price point, that's not receiving the other version for free. They're just charging you for two games. And they're both the exact same. I'd say the 3DS version feels a bit more right. On Wii U, you play entirely on the gamepad with the TV screen just displaying your whole view. But man, this just looks naked. I don't know, the game is fine, but these games just feel like busy work, like a crossword puzzle. You don't go, damn, now that was a crossword puzzle. You play them when you want to keep your mind from wandering. Amiibo Tap Nintendo's Greatest Bits also came to Wii U. Ooh, I like that subtitle. A free application based around finding something for Amiibo figures to do. These guys launched right alongside Super Smash Brothers for Wii U that past holiday season, and everybody loved Buying them. Yeah, scanning these things on the Wii U gamepad was often followed up by disappointment. Oh man, I wanted a hug. So Amiibo Tap was developed by Nintendo as a means to bring more value to Amiibo figures. Could just start shipping them with fives. So we scan an Amiibo and unlock a scene from a classic NES or SNES game. Oh, so the full game? No. Uh, well, maybe a remix bit of an old title, like an NES remix? Nah. -uh. Okay, so th at least I can scan Mario and unlock a Mario game. You. So, Amiibo Tap, you can scan any Amiibo, you unlock a demo for a random virtual console game, scan Link, you just might get... What? Virtual console games for five to eight dollars. You're telling me you couldn't have had something where you scan a Mario Amiibo, you get the original Super Mario Brothers? No? Eh, these figures NFC chips are too easy to replicate and make dummy versions of, so I assume this was the only way they could have realistically done it. But damn if it isn't still worthless. What about an NES Remix 3 where you scan Mario characters, you get remix challenges with them in other NES games? Nah, just give Amiibo owners a demo for Mach Rider, cause we need to make room in our warehouse. Did you know Art Academy Home Studio launched on Wii U this year? Lucky you, silence was the right answer. So yeah, two years after Art Academy Sketchpad launched, the full version released for 30 bones, replacing Sketchpad on the eShop, so you couldn't choose between the $4 drawing application and the $30 one. Listen, I see the value in this title as a teaching tool. It's just harder when you offer the main thing you're gonna be doing in the game for seven times less cash. It's like what, I've been using Art Academy's Sketchpad for two years and then I say, finally, now I can learn how to draw. This is pretty much Sketchpad, but with lessons included. And the lessons in this game are fantastic. This is a wonderful way to teach about art. And this is a game that does benefit from being on Wii U with the gamepad. But I feel like this took way too long to release after Sketchpad. And by the time it did, I think everybody forgot a full-fledged Art Academy was even coming Coming to Wii U, I think most assumed Sketchpad was it. And being an eShop exclusive definitely didn't help things. It got physical releases elsewhere in the world though, with Europe titling it Art Academy Adiolet. That is a room in which art is done. 
I wish North America had a more similar titling method. In the end, it's fair to say this is one of Nintendo's most forgettable Wii U releases. They barely advertised it, only released here via the eShop, and it's easily confused with the $4 app that came out in 2013. All this game is is an alibi. I drew this the day of, your honor. It, it couldn't have been me. Seems that Nintendo was starting to release more games exclusively on the eShop when they just weren't confident in their retail presence. Case in point, Fatal Frame, Maiden of Black Water. Yeah, Nintendo, do a digital only release for a 14 gigabyte game on your system that only has 8 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte variations. You're a fucking genius. Can you make me happy next? This is just something that always perplexed me. Obviously, this game didn't get a physical release because it was deemed too risky. Like, ah, oh, we're probably not gonna attract new fans with this series. It's too niche. Why not just put it out on the eShop so we don't have to go through the whole rigmarole of releasing a physical copy? But then you put out Devil's Third and Tokyo Mirage Sessions out physically. Plus, this game got physical releases in Japan and Europe. And if you really weren't concerned about making new fans with this game, why did you release it as a free download so people could play the first bit of the game and then be prompted to pay for the rest of it? Or are you trying to attract new fans or not? Because something not appealing to new fans is having to download a 14 gigabyte file on a system that takes four years to load a loading screen. Oh, finally. So Fatal Frame is an odd series. It was originally only on PlayStation 2 and Xbox before becoming a Nintendo exclusive for a bit. Fatal Frame 2 was remade just for Wii alongside new entry Fatal Frame 4. The spin-off Spirit Camera was exclusive to 3DS and of course, Fatal Frame Maiden of Blackwater. The fifth main entry was only on Wii U. Being a series about taking pictures of ghosts, <laughs> I mean, damn, I think that was the Wii U's MO. Using the gamepad, moving it around like a camera. Obviously, this was the perfect fit consistently. Conceptually. In practice, it isn't this undeniable upgrade from a standard controller. It's still just a gimmick. It's cute, but isn't necessary at all, evident by the game's release on non-Nintendo systems a few years later. The game itself, in my opinion, it's a bit of a love it or hate it kind of title. I never got too into it as a horror game due to how scripted and predictable the scares are, plus how stiff and clunky it is to control the main character. If you think in a horror game, it would be potentially beneficial to have stiffer movement. It makes when you have to book it that much harder, which can increase the fear. It doesn't do that here. The stiff controls just don't feel great, probably because what am I running away from? What am I afraid of? A bad shot? But I still think there's a lot to appreciate with this game. I think it looks and sounds good and the core gameplay works just fine. It's definitely an acquired taste though, so releasing this game as a free download to try it out, eh, I can see where they were coming from with that now. Appeal to people who will download anything because it's free. Your Honor, in my defense, it was free. The only other major release of Nintendo's this year on the Wii U eShop was the Splatoon Global Test Fire, a free download to try out Splatoon during specific times and days before its release in May of 2015. Not much else to say here. It was just an app that let you play the online multiplayer for hour-long spurts through the day on May 9th with another event happening on May 23rd. It was obviously successful as it showcased the value and fun of Splatoon, helping push it to become an incredibly popular franchise right out the gate, which is why Nintendo's done similar online test apps for Splatoon 2, ARMS, Mario Tennis Aces, Splatoon 3, Mario Strikers Battle League, etc. It makes it a fun event where everybody's trying to game out for the first time altogether. If only they did that for Black. Indie releases really hit their peak this year on Wii U. We got so many amazing titles, and yeah, I'll say it, Black is one of them. Oh, thank God. This was originally a mobile game, but one of the classy ones. A game that genuinely needs a touchscreen, so obviously mobile made the most sense for it, though thankfully it got a Wii U release. It's all about drawing formations that repeat indefinitely so you can try to hit certain icons while avoiding others. It's just a really solid little puzzle game that gets pretty tricky pretty early on, though no stage ever feels unbeatable. Citizens of Earth was an Atlas published RPG, heavily inspired by Earthbound that also launched on 3DS that I always found pretty damn charming. Dot Arcade was an interesting Wii U exclusive, being based on the most primitive form of video game, Lights. This came out the same year PS4 got Rocket League. Come on guys, just buy the Wii U. Why? Uh... Now Freedom Planet, this was a great one. Originally created as a Sonic fan game, the developer ended up turning it into its own thing entirely, which was no doubt a good move. And while this released on PC before, for consoles, this was only on Wii U for a few years. See, that was a benefit of the Wii U having little to no AAA third-party support. It allowed for indies to shine, and I'm sure many put their games out as exclusives as they felt in debt to Nintendo for all they've done for gaming. 
or they felt really bad for them. Rumbo was another exclusive for a while there, this one being a platformer where the color of the background changes constantly, and thus if certain platforms are that color, they disappear until the background changes again. It can be played as a standard platformer, racing game, party game, fighting game, <laughs> this thing has it all, with a really great concept, style, and soundtrack to boot. Plus it features genuinely one of the largest cast of indie game characters ever. So many of them are playable here, specifically tons from Wii U and 3DS games. A lot of the indie games made for these systems during this time feel connected in some way, probably due to them being pushed alongside each other in Nintendo Directs. But this game really does highlight that sense of community. But where Slender? Slender The Arrival, sequel to the viral game Slender from 2012. This was a big deal online. Everybody liked to record themselves playing, pissing themselves. Nostalgia, what I would give to piss myself again. That was a free game, so it was much more impressive. As a cheap little jump scare game, it worked well. Slender The Arrival is on a different level, considering you have to pay for it. And I just feel like less is more here. Uh, this game feels like they were under a lot of pressure after their free little game blew up online so they had to follow it up with something bigger, more ambitious, but they just couldn't execute it well. Look at this, this is a choppy mess. Also, I will say, this might have been a problem with Fatal Frame. I think it's physically impossible to be scared with this in your hands. Now to onlookers, yeah, this is f***ing terrifying. Octodad, Dadly as Catch, the original Trine Enchanted Edition, Whoa Dave, Zeo Drifter, Don't Starve Giant Edition, the Gunman Clive HD Collection, which bundled Gunman Clive and Gunman Clive 2, which released earlier this year for 3DS, Ali Ali, Electronic Super Joy, <laughs> all fantastic to see come to the console. But without a doubt, the biggest to see was the Binding of Isaac Rebirth on not only Wii U, but 3DS as well, specifically the new 3DS line of systems. It seems that Nintendo has finally loosened their stance on content coming to their platforms. Thank God. But we got a fair amount more games that were Wii U only, at least for the time being. Typo Man was always a game that looked beyond intriguing. A platformer using words and letters to build the environment, creating this gloomy, dystopian world where you have to solve puzzles with wordplay. Th this sounds amazing. In the end though, this is a pretty damn basic game. It doesn't go far enough with its concept. This concept has all the potential in the world to be one where every element of the game design just clicks into place. But in the end, it's a basic platformer where you have to solve puzzles by putting letters together. It's not bad at all. It just doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of its potential. Elliot Quest, Swords and Soldiers 2, Human Resource Machine by the World of Goo developers. This was a packed year for independent Wii U console exclusives, but three titles really stood out to me. First up, Affordable Space Adventures, a game that, by design, only works on Wii U. This was a Wii U exclusive. It will probably always be a Wii U exclusive, and that's because of how much it depends on the Wii U gamepad. As you move your ship around, you have to keep an eye on the controller to adjust any necessary options, with other players being able to assume different roles, which while this is a fine single player game, that makes it a great multiplayer one. Fast Racing Neo was a big deal, as this was being touted as this brand new, not F-Zero game. See, if Nintendo fans want anything, it's games they don't buy. But Fast Neo was one everybody should have bought. This was one of the highest quality indie releases on Wii U. It is incredible what the developer Shinnin was able to do here and they went all out. They even hired the announcer from F-Zero GX for this game. They wanted this to be a sort of magnum opus of futuristic racing titles. With that being said, I feel like this has more in common with the Wipeout games on PlayStation than F-Zero. You gotta swap the colors of your ship to match portions of the track or items to collect. It's a really good fast-paced racing game that, even if it's not exactly the same, does scratch a bit of the itch for a new F-Zero, and I should really stop scratching. Though I'd say the biggest Wii U eShop game of 2015 was, without a doubt, well, I already talked about Amiibo Tap. Minecraft Wii U Edition. Yeah, the fact it took this long for Minecraft to hit the Wii U shows that it didn't leave much of a lasting impression. If they put this out in 2013 and maybe put in some cool gamepad features, maybe you'd have something there. Nope, it was just a straight conversion of Minecraft. It works fine. But was this really gonna sell Wii U's? A way to play Minecraft a year before the system gets discontinued? Regardless, this was at least heartwarming to see at the time. Go like, on, they're taking the ugly kid to prom. On the 3DS side of things, man, it wasn't just pigs that were flying, these were full-blown hogs. So back on DSiWare, one of the most prolific titles was Flip Note Studio, a free app that gave you the ability to make simple animations and share them around the world. 
I absolutely love this thing to bits, how simple it was to quickly make something, regardless if you were a complete novice or animation veteran. Sadly though, this was one of the few DSiWare titles not available on the 3DS eShop. However, Nintendo announced plans for a successor made specifically for the platform, Flipnote Studio 3D. This was first mentioned around the time the 3DS originally launched and was later detailed via a Nintendo Direct in March of 2013, with it releasing in Japan a few months later, followed by a launch in Europe and North America scheduled for August 2013. Now my science project in school that year was, what if it wasn't? I'm sorry. Yeah, this game just didn't release outside of Japan for the longest time. Nintendo said the initial delay was due to them wanting to better prepare the online service for the worldwide launch, and then Flipnote 3D's online sharing tool was roped in with Swapnote's big controversy. Jesus Christ, what were they sending on Flipnote? So after all of this, Nintendo went silent on a release outside of Japan. That was until February of 2015, when Nintendo launched the game exclusively through their loyalty program, Club Nintendo, as they announced that program's discontinuation. So Flipnote 3D was sort of a parting gift. You just get a code to redeem the game on the eShop. It was completely free for all users, so why not just put it on the eShop? The same reason you don't put your diary on there. This is just embarrassing. It's such a gutted release with no online functionality whatsoever. Ever. One of the best aspects of the original Flipnote Studio was browsing what other users were creating and stripping that out. I mean, it's still a damn good simplistic animation tool, and one that allows you to create animations in 3D now, which is awesome. But I just always felt so lonely using this. Flipnote Studio 3D is a robust and wonderfully designed little tool to make animation for fun, but likes everything that made the original so beloved. Damn, I need a rebound after that. This is a debound. Pokemon Shuffle, releasing less than a year after Pokemon Battle Troze. Yeah, I can see why they warranted this new title releasing. Keep in mind, I also just dropped my glasses. So these are pretty much the exact same goddamn game. The Shuffle does have a much better presentation overall, and the structure does lend things to stay far more fresh as time goes on. One problem, it's free. Like that's gonna stop me. Another one of Nintendo's free to play experiments, though this one leans far more into the traditional mobile game method. You can only play so many stages before your hearts run out after which you need to wait for them to replenish to play more of the game, or you could flat out buy more with your hard-earned cash. So that's sort of the issue here. Pokemon Shuffle has better gameplay, but a horrible pricing structure, while Pokemon Battle Troze is far more boring, but is thankfully just one flat fee. So, which one would I recommend? Not Pokemon Rumble World. Another free-to-play game, and it's Pokemon Rumble? It's like a serial killer that smells bad. But to be fair, this game is set up to be far less greedy than Pokemon Shuffle, where making in-game purchases is almost required to get anywhere. In Pokemon on Rumble World, you can buy these diamonds that help you progress with actual money or earn them by simply playing the game. And honestly, the simplicity of Pokemon Rumble works fairly well as a free to play title, especially one that's set up this way. This is an actual game giving me actual levels to walk through, unlike Pokemon Rumble U, which is more concerned with giving me something foul. Plus, hey, if you're not into this, they released a physical version for one flat price later down the line. Damn, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Pokemon Rumble World? Eh. I mean, it's still Pokemon Rumble, it's not great, and for this series, saying that might as well be proposing to it. But that wasn't the last of the free-to-play Pokemon eShop releases this year. In December of 2015, we got a big f***ing problem, that's what we got. Pokemon Picross. I love Picross. Pokemon? Well, it starts with the same letter as Picross. It's my favorite and least favorite thing. It's a sexy serial killer. Yeah, this is definitely Picross, but now with some light Pokemon elements thrown into the gameplay. Each puzzle is based on a specific Pokemon, and when you finish it, you can then use that Pokemon and their special abilities in future puzzles to help out. So yeah, it has a bit more personality than a typical Picross game, but when that personality is being communicated through pixel art that barely moves, it's not really a game changer. When it comes to the free to play aspect, the game thankfully caps you out after spending about 30 bones and proceeds to make all the in-game currency free following that. Without spending money, it takes far too long to unlock everything and progress through the title. Though with spending money, I mean, $30 for this? Come on, I could buy the, the the Pokemon Rumble World for that. This one's all right, just feels a bit forced into the free to play model rather than being fully designed around it. Much like Stretch Mo. Another entry in the Mo series, this one being free to download. The idea here is that you can purchase certain batches of levels if you just want certain stages or just a handful for cheap, or you can buy them all together for a discounted price of 10 bones, around the same price as the previous titles. The different level packs all have unique themes such as NES games or having to avoid obstacles while solving the puzzle. But if you just buy the 
bundle with everything, it's just like any other push mode game after that. It just kind of makes the free to start model a bit worthless here. I mean, I get it. It makes it easier for newcomers to hop in and try out a few things for free. Then maybe dabble in just a couple dozen stages for three bucks instead of biting the bullet on a $10 game. But man, the main course of levels here is $5, and that's pretty damn close to the original Pushmo's price point. So it's like, if you want a good starting point for the series, you seriously can't do any better than the first. And I feel like this pricing structure, while in theory could pull newcomers in, I feel that it can honestly deter them alongside longtime fans. Nobody wants to download a free game, then 10 minutes in get a tin can rattled in their face. The game itself, I mean, it's another Pushmo game, though this time you have the ability to expand and pull out blocks from the side. Once again, it's fantastic, though strangely, things are starting to get real samey. Even with the incredible amount of gameplay differences between each of the games, I don't know, with so many games releasing so close to each other and all being eShop games where you're pulling blocks around in the grass, can you blame me for getting burnt out? I just wish Pushmo became bigger than it did. I would have loved to see a full retail release or a new entry evolving the series further rather than just coming up with a new twist to the block puzzles and boom, there's a new game right there. And with Stretchmo being the last of the series on the eShop here, 2015 felt like we were passing the torch from one eShop icon over to another. Introducing Box Boy, developed by HAL Laboratory, the people behind Kirby. Very simple platformer where you can push out blocks from your character here and form them in certain ways to solve puzzles, make a bridge, a step, shield yourself with them, etc. This has some really simple, yet incredibly smart design to it all. Though it was always hard for me to get fully invested in this series. I mean, its simplicity is beautiful, but also its biggest detractor in my opinion. While the design here is smart, I don't think it's as smart as other puzzle games with basic visuals for this to truly stand out to me. A good game with solid mechanics, just what I feel wouldn't be talked about nearly as much if it weren't made by the Kirby developers. If it were made by the Dr. Mario Miracle Cure developers, none of you would bet an eye. Yeah, also releasing this year was a new Dr. Mario game. For $9, you get Dr. Mario gameplay or Dr. Luigi gameplay like the L-shaped pills, plus online and local multiplayer, the virus buster mode, and a new mode entirely featuring power-ups. Why was this $6 cheaper than Dr. Luigi? Cause Mario just rolled out a fucking bed for this one. What's up with his face? Seriously though, when this released, it was the definitive modern Dr. Mario experience. The Nintendo 64 game still had a unique single player story mode and four player multiplayer, but this has everything else you could really ask for from Dr. Mario. And for $9, being cheaper than both Dr. Luigi and the original Dr. Mario Online RX on WiiWare, I don't really see how you could pass on this. I found my glasses. Well, Dr. Mario is always good, simple, fun, but see, after like 17 entries, you need more than just, it's Dr. Mario on this platform to keep me interested. That's pretty much all Dr. Luigi was, and thankfully Miracle Cure has the power-ups plus everything else from the previous few games. But it's still really not enough for me to care tremendously. Visually, these are some of the most boring games out there. Like, my God, could you pick maybe a third background color? Saw a little puzzle game, but is not something to write home about. But something that is, <laughs> oh boy. The Nintendo Badge Arcade, a free application well, not anymore. See, back in 2014, Nintendo updated the 3DS to support custom themes. You could download a variety of themes from the theme shop and really express yourself through the 3DS menu system. It's a Legend of Dark Witch Blad kind of day. To go alongside these themes, you could further customize your system with badges to place around the user interface where the game icons would go. And the only way to get these badges is through the Badge Arcade, hosted by a rabbit. Say what you want, that's impressive. You have all these different claw machines you can play where you try to nab some badges based on all kinds of Nintendo or video game things. It's pretty simple, but oddly satisfying to try and get all the badges in a machine, even if I wouldn't be caught dead with them on my home screen. The app was consistently updated with new collections of badges to collect and new types of machines that offer a twist on the traditional claw machine. This is a supremely fun little app that ruined the lives of millions. One dollar for five attempts to get some PNGs? That adds up. When you see a 3DS with the entire Pokemon lineup on its home screen, that indicates a ruined marriage. I think everything about this app was brilliant, though the pricing could have been a bit more generous, I think. This sort of app is designed to be as addictive as possible to keep feeding money into it. Uh, sure, it's supposed to be just like normal crane games, and it succeeds at feeling like that. But it's wild to me that with how much people this 
buys microtransactions and loot boxes and all of that, this app didn't get much heat at all. And looking at the cons listed in these reviews, I can see why. Third party and indie wise, this was an incredibly light year. Attack on Titan Humanity in Chains was a retail game in Japan, localized in English, but released only via the Nintendo eShop by Atlas, thank God. Ironfall Invasion was yet another free to start game, this time as a third person shooter with single and multiplayer, thank God God. This one is no doubt impressive, highlighted by Nintendo in their January 2015 Nintendo Direct, uh, they stated this game was developed by three whole people. But man, this is just the type of game you play when you genuinely have no other console other than a 3DS. Dementium Remastered, a re-release of the Nintendo DS game by Renegade Kids, similar to their other remaster, Moo Chronicles. They have such range, don't they? Terraria received a 3DS port alongside probably the biggest indie game on 3DS this year, Steam World Heist. A new entry in the Steam World series, this one being a turn-based tactical game. Well, with so little occurring this year on the eShop, 2016 should have many Mario and Friends Amiibo Challenge. It's all been building up to this. On both the Wii U and 3DS eShop, we got the same thing again. Mini Mario and Friends Amiibo Challenge. It may not be called Mario vs. Donkey Kong, but it sure smells like it. This is a free game that requires Amiibo figures to play, and unlike Amiibo Tap, it's not Amiibo Tap. Thank God. To be fair, it's hard to complain about this game considering it does give you substantial content with your Amiibo figures. The unique stages for each of these characters, all specifically designed to complement their aesthetics and abilities. You get four special levels per character alongside the 12 stages all characters can play through. If you only have one or two of these Amiibo, that's a pretty light adventure. If you own all of them, damn, why would you need any other game? It's definitely more interesting of a release than Tipping Stars, even if that is a more complete and structurally sound title but for a free app you can download to get some quick gameplay out of your amiibo from, this ain't half bad. Now Star Fox Zero, that was full blown half bad. There is a free eShop download promoting the game. Star Fox Zero, the battle begins plus training. Basically, it plays a promotional animated short for the game while also containing the training mode from Star Fox Zero. Basically, it's a demo. Now Star Fox Guard, the game bundled with Star Fox Zero, also had a demo. But this one was called the Special Demo. These both released months after the game launched. I really let anybody on the fence about this game realize they shouldn't even be close to it. And that is pretty much it when it comes to Nintendo's first party output on the Wii U eShop. In general, that was it. Without any complaints, well, they never made a Lost Reavers like experience. Oh, well, thank God for Namco. The last major year of the Wii U's relevancy still contains some noteworthy eShop experiences by third parties, including Lost Reavers by Bandai Namco. This was originally announced in January 2015 as Project Treasure, a free-to-play multiplayer title all about surviving through enemies and traps to then find and collect treasure, eventually being renamed to Lost Reavers. It's exclusive to Wii U, that's a selling point. This is how I think things went. Nintendo asked Bandai Namco to make an exclusive Wii U title, so they decided to make something that's more tax write off than game. Turns out this was mostly created as a test project, I guess. A game that younger developers in Namco could cut their teeth on. Damn, the Wii U was used. There's just nothing to this game. It's so generic and bland. Just a second rate pet project Nintendo used to make it seem like the Wii U was getting legitimate third party support. The Wii U has lost Reavers, unlike the other guys. We also have Birdmania Party. Why did they put Birdmania out on Wii U in 2016? Super Meat Boy hit the system, which was a lovely surprise. Though they had to replace the original soundtrack due to a licensing dispute. Steam World Heist received a port, Odd World New and Tasty, which was a pretty massive title to make the jump. Axiom Verge was a big deal. That was the Metroid-like game at the time, and to have it on a Nintendo system felt like a match made in heaven. Minecraft Story Mode. <laughs> okay, so this was all in the era of the Telltale games, all those point and click interactive drama games like The Walking Dead, Batman, Tales from the Borderlands. We didn't get any of those, but we did get Minecraft Story Mode and some more milk to help us sleep at night. Hey, Minecraft's for everybody. It does massively appeal to kids, but it's a general audience type of game. But it being the only Telltale game we got was just kind of insulting. Like, come on! 
The Walking Dead Telltale series was one of the biggest games of all time. It got a damn Ouya release, and you're telling me the only game you could warrant putting on Wii U was Minecraft Story Mode? Mutant Mud Super Challenge, released across both Wii U and 3DS. It's actually a sequel to the original, but the name makes it sound more like an expansion pack. It's a tough as nails follow up, and a great continuation of the original Mutant Muds. Though I'd say it took too long to come out and didn't do enough to distinguish itself from the original. It's pretty much just harder mutant muds. It does an excellent job of being that, but by 2016, I think it was too little too late. Tumblestone was an indie puzzle game Nintendo pushed hard. It was either this or Bombing Bastards. And I'd say the last major release of 2016 was Pirate Pop Plus, which was a little tribute to old school handheld gaming. Other than that, original releases on the Wii Wii Shop were basically relegated to releases. But the 3DS eShop, that's where Nintendo fans were spending their 2016. Questioning their faith. My Nintendo Picross The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess was another loyalty program exclusive eShop game. This one you'd get from using the Club Nintendo replacement, My Nintendo. Like Hepatitis. My Nintendo is a piece of junk, like... Just look at all these digital rewards. My Nintendo theme 2 Donkey Kong? The only reason I'd get that is if I had something to hide. My Nintendo Picross Twilight Princess was just a smaller promotional title. The Picross games were easy to churn out for 3DS, and Twilight Princess HD for Wii U just came out, so hey, let's promote this to our most loyal fans. Yeah, the ones with the release date tattoo. It's a fine, albeit obviously budget version of Picross with Twilight Princess art in it. Now, if that's not what you're interested in, Box Box Boy has nearly none of those elements. The sequel to Box Boy, you know? I always wondered what happened next. Box Box Boy is very much just more of the same, except now you can create two sets of boxes, which that doesn't really feel like that warrants a sequel. What, does just adding an ability do that? What does taking one away do? If Box Boy gets a limb cut off, is that a prequel? Again, a fine, fun little puzzle game. It's just nothing too special. Unlike Pocket Card Jockey, developed by Game Freak, this combines horse racing and solitaire. Thank God they picked those two out of the hat. So I love the energy of this game. It's so silly and the dialogue just does not take itself seriously at all with a really dumb and fun explanation of why these two things are combined here. But they complement each other. The horse racing element makes playing solitaire more exciting and solitaire makes horse racing far deeper in video game form. These two things just go together like peanut butter and 40 million dollars. Yeah, that's a good combo. Swap Doodle. Uh-oh. I assume this would have been the 3DS's first AO game, but nah. This is a successor to Swap Node in nearly every way. Why they waited until 2016 to do so? Maybe that year child safety was getting a little too comfortable. Swap Doodle is pretty much just Swap Node again. Though this time with in-app purchases like drawing lessons and stationery and a few features removed, such as the ability to include photos you've taken. But obviously for security reasons. Really strange to me how similar this is to the original app with only a couple of things altered, especially after how much the initial controversies obviously affected Nintendo's decision making with this kind of stuff. In the end, it's another form of swap note, but released at a time in which I can't really see many people saying they heavily got into this one. Outside of those releases, Nintendo put out a handful of heavy duty eShop games, titles that were designed to be sold at retail and in other regions were, but here in North America, they feared what we'd do with a box. Perjury's pretty cool. The most unfortunate eShop exclusive for us has to be Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix, a game Nintendo of America assumed wouldn't do well at retail, which is ridiculous. I'd buy it. That doesn't mean much, doesn't it? Mega Mix is a collection of some of the best games from throughout the entire Rhythm Heaven series. The remade and enhanced to all fit within this title alongside a handful of brand new scenarios. While most of this is older content, it's all been recreated to feel like everything fits together. For example, games from the DS entry that were played in a different orientation with touch controls are now played in standard widescreen with buttons. Coupled with the new story mode, extra modes, and overall presentation, this makes Mega Mix feel less like a compilation and more like its own game that just so happens to include some reused content. This is phenomenal and a wonderful way to put out a new entry in a series that may not do well, so it's smart and honestly, probably one of the best, if not the best, Rhythm Heaven game. We also received Picross 3D Round 2 on the eShop exclusively over here, while in Europe and Japan they also got physical releases. Who needs them anyways? Now I have more space for my thoughts. Picross 3D was a DS title that translated standard Picross puzzles into 3D cubes, maintaining the general rules but altering them quite a lot to work with that added dimension, and after some tutorials, it becomes very addicting. 
it's a much more complicated yet engaging version of Picross that I think got even better with round 2 on the 3DS. The added horsepower does numbers to the experience. Everything feels so much smoother with loads more personality in the backgrounds and the puzzles. And there are new twists with differently colored spots that overall make Picross 3D round 2 just one of the best little puzzle games. With third parties, we got a sequel to Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Dual Destinies, this time Spirit of Justice, also an eShop exclusive, Boo, Gurman 3D, a monstrous adventure, a port of this older PSP game, and that's basically it for 2016. I hope you're looking forward to Box 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 Boy next year. Oh, oh, thank God I made it. 2017, the year of the Nintendo Switch, also the year of Bye Bye Box Boy on the Nintendo 3DS. With only 365 days, it's incredible we had room for both. Bye Bye Box Boy is more of the same, and still a good little puzzle platformer, but I truly don't know what else to say about it. It's fine, but my opinion of the original Box Boy is the exact same as any game that followed it. Tank Troopers by Nintendo is a pretty basic tank game with single player and multiplayer, though the multiplayer is not online, which I don't blame them for not putting online multiplayer in a 3DS eShop game in 2017, but with multiplayer being front and center here on the menu, it's obviously a big part of this game's identity and reason to exist, so why bother if you're not offering online? Though I will say, the production values are exquisite for an eShop game. The full 3D environments, voice acting, fun character designs, it's a rock solid little game. Though being a little game just wasn't really enough to get me and others to open their 3DS systems around this time. Much like two Kirby titles that released within the year, similar situation to the Kirby Fighters Deluxe and Dedede's Drum Dash Deluxe fiasco, these are two games based on sub-games found in 2016's Kirby Planet Robobot, Team Kirby Clash, and Kirby 3D Rumble. We got Team Kirby Clash Deluxe, which was free to start with microtransactions littered in there. I mean, if you're gonna make these standalone, making them free makes more sense than charging, what, $7 for this standalone? For this? This! For what it is, Team Kirby Clash Deluxe is fine. Basically just a game comprising of nothing but boss battles, though the other title, Kirby's Blowout Blast, is definitely more interesting. Based on the four second long Kirby 3D Rumble, Blowout Blast is 12 seconds long. A 3D Kirby game, long before they made the official jump with Kirby in the Forgotten Land on Nintendo Switch. Though this is way more basic, way more restrictive, and way less fun. You can't transform into enemies like in most traditional Kirby games. This is sort of a 3D reimagining of the original Kirby's Dream Land on Game Boy. You can inhale enemies, then spit them out, and you want to try and rack up combos by spitting them at the right time and angle. But that's pretty much all this game is, cruising through a few levels, defeating enemies, and before you know it, what do you know, my week just opened up. It's fun enough, but I wouldn't say it's worth much more than $6. Damn. Just really too short to be worth a damn, but I couldn't imagine the core gameplay loop being much fun for any long Longer than the game is. In addition to those, Nintendo released yet another retail game as an eShop exclusive over here, this time being Style Savvy Styling Star on Christmas Day. Jesus Christ. The Style Savvy series is a consistent entity, one that refused to go away during the 3DS generation, but one that I'm not against. These aren't bad games, far from it. Just because they don't appeal to you doesn't mean they don't have any right existing. And for a style focused business simulation game, it's pretty damn that. It's just. For such a niche casual game like this, I question how putting it on the eShop really helps it. Nintendo was still pumping out retail 3DS titles at the time, and making this game whose target demographic, I'm not sure how many of them is logging into the 3DS eShop in late 2017 to buy a game for $40 exclusive there, I'm just kinda curious to see those sales numbers. Outside of Nintendo's contributions, Capcom came out with another Ace Attorney title, this one being a 3DS remaster of Apollo Justice. Not a huge leap forward or anything, just pretty much the original game in widescreen with cleaned up sprites and a 3D effect. Blaster Master Zero, which I always associate with the Nintendo Switch eShop around its launch, actually released day and date on the 3DS, which is pretty damn interesting. And Chicken Wiggle was one of the last major exclusive indie games on the system. By the same developer as Mutant Muds and Zero Drifter, this is a clever little puzzle platformer with a level building mode. Really cool, but after they expressed disappointment in the sales of the title, I mean, yeah, that stinks, but it's a 3DS exclusive in 2017. What could be worse than that? 2018. Dylan's Dead Heat Breakers, the third Dylan game, because like, could you really end it here? With so many questions left? This was actually a retail game in other regions, which is pretty cool to see the series get a bigger budget and push. 
as a 3DS game in 2018. Oh man, thank you for getting me that water I said I needed. But it's instantly apparent how much more detail and care was put into this entry. Still Dylan though. It is probably the best game in the whole series, but at the end of the day, it's still the same damn armadillo from five years ago. SteamWorld Dig 2 may have launched on Nintendo Switch in 2017, but it actually got a 3DS version in February of 2018, which is just bizarre to see and even weirder to play. I mean, it's pretty cool to see games you don't associate with the 3DS on this screen like PDI check. And yeah, in 2019, we got vision testing software on the 3DS eShop for $100. Why was I more pissed about Kirby Blowout Blast's price? Shakedown Hawaii released for 3DS in 2019, the successor to Retro City Rampage, and that's it! That is roughly the entire life of the 3DS and Wii U eShops. I mean, I have loads of amazing memories with both of these, but by the end of it, it was obvious nobody was using these damn things. Guys, we gotta go! I, I know who the killer is! I'll drive. He didn't lie. This will give us a good look at the criminal. This isn't a criminal. This is grass! Just listen to me. Who would have a motive to kill the Nintendo eShop? You know, on second thought, this grass has nothing to lose. Some may think Nintendo was the one to kill the eShop, but why does the store live in the first place? What purpose does it have staying open? I don't think this was death by homicide. I think this was death by neglect. Nintendo wasn't the eShop killer. It was us. of all the dead eShop releases are tormenting the citizens! What the f***? What the f***? Why are there ghosts every f***ing where? What did you do? Dude! Everywhere f***ing ghosts? That's not okay! It's not okay! Yeah, Jesus Christ. Mob is forming! Those guys killed the East Shop! Let's get them! Ah! Guys! Guys! There's no sense in riding over this or tearing ourselves down. I came up here to see the entire world responsible for the East Shop shutting down, and instead I unleashed all the games killed by the store closing. But you know what? I think these spirits being out here shows that their legacy will forever live on. Fans have archived damn near everything online. Uh, many of the games from these eShops have been re-released on modern platforms or through physical means. Uh, the eShops may be over, but their legacy will forever be remembered. And if Nintendo isn't going to preserve it, we sure as hell will. But we can't just sit around and complain about Nintendo shutting down eShops we weren't using in the first place. We killed the eShops because we didn't care enough about them for the longest time. And oh, now they're awesome? I looked at pretty much the entire lives of both eShops, and they hold some incredible memories for me. But I should have talked about them sooner. Uh, even if I didn't have anything new to buy from them, I could have talked about them to somebody and maybe convinced them to check them out. We all have to appreciate these things in the moment and keep appreciating them. And we can't ignore them until it's too late. I've said pretty much everything I can about the 3DS and Wii U Wii shops. I oddly don't feel at peace. Cause I'm gonna have to talk about this again!